All right, I think we're ready to get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Federal Mobility Group and ATARC 5G Government Symposium. My name is Gemma Howell. I am a computer scientist at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and I also am the NIST co-chair on the Federal Mobility Group. It is my privilege and pleasure on behalf of the Federal Mobility Group to welcome you all here today. I wanna to start by thanking you all for taking the time to attend today's event. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. We have the chat and Q&A available. Uh, we also look forward to discussing 5G and how it is or will impact us all. We've come such a long way from the first generation cell phones, which were big, bulky, and the size of my head. <laughs> Uh, then 2G came along and I was very impressed at how fast I could text a uh, text message using a numeric keypad. 3G brought us online, but it wasn't until 4G where we could really appreciate the speeds and access to streaming rapid data. Now we have more and more users and devices that need access to data. And that brings us to 5G, the next generation of wireless which will be able to handle more traffic and deliver information even faster than previous generations. Today, we have a lot in store for you. Coming up is an overview of the Federal Mobility Group, our visionary keynote speaker, the Principal Director for 5G, Dr. Joseph Evans from the United States Department of Defense, and Tom Sutter, CEO and founder of ATARC to give an intro to, to ATARC and then share the rest of today's agenda. Right now, I'd like to in introduce the ne next session where you will hear from the Federal Mobility Group co-chairs. That includes the DHS CISA co-chair, Vincent Seretapan, the G GSA co-chair, Jim Russo, and myself as the NIST co-chair, and also our Federal Mobility Group 5G pillar lead, Joshua Weaver from DOD. We will be giving an overview of the Federal Mobility Group our role in sharing some of our recent accomplishments. With that, I'll hand it over to Vincent Seretapan to get us started. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Gemma. Um, hello everyone, uh, my name is Vincent Seretapan uh, from CISA, uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, I wanna welcome everybody here today, uh, really to give you an overview for Federal Mobility Group, uh, talk about some of our accomplishments uh, to date and um, you know, sort of over the past uh, year or two, specifically, you know, as we've sort of uh, gone through the, the pandemic, um, what we've been able to accomplish, um, really uh, pre and post, right, uh, COVID. And um, so, what I'll note is, what is Federal Mobility Group? So, for many of you, you may you may know or may not know that it is a, a community of practice underneath the Federal CIO Council, Federal CISO Council. So, we are chartered underneath them. Uh, specifically, we are working on common challenges um, that we may have across the, the federal departments and agencies and where we share best practices, uh, work on those challenges, and, um, and really uh, overarching uh, work together to resolve them, right? So I'll note that uh, going forward, you know, our authorities come from the, the federal CIO council and, and that construct. Uh, we do have a reporting uh, how do I say it? a uh, reported dot in line uh, matrix relationship to the federal IT category manager and the Office of Federal Procurement and Policy, so OFPP. Um, what I'll note specifically is our background, right? So some of you may know some of us have uh, been around for, for some, quite some time uh, where you may remember things like the digital government strategy back in 2011, you know, 2012 timeframe. Um, where uh, you actually thought, remember things like the mobile technology tiger team, right? Um, that group actually combined with uh, out of OMB 16-20 uh, uh, actually covers the mobile services category team, MSCT. Um, and specifically, we, we found folks that, hey, we were working on security and all the challenges within uh, federal mobility uh, and then we had another group also working on category management for mobility, right? Uh, what are we purchasing? How can we uh, lower spend associated uh, with that? Um, understanding everything from, you know, what we have to how do we secure it? So the combination of the two groups honestly uh, made a great fit. Um, so just back in, I believe, a July of, of uh, two Julys ago, right? Two, yeah, at least, 
uh, that where we were actually originally chartered, uh, this group came together, right? So common folks across the, the federal government, we allow both uh, in this case, a government with a .gov.mil email address uh, and specifically a contractor supporting government. Um, I'll note that we do, we are only covering and focusing on non-national security and mobility missions related uh, to, you know, related challenges faced by agencies. Um, I, I say that specifically because there is a specific side for national security uh, systems and, and that side of the house is governed by CNSS, right? And so we, we have the, the portion that is not. Um, I'll note our executive leadership currently is uh, Mr. Nicholas Ward. He is the CISO for the Department of Justice. Our co-chairs are myself from DHS, uh, CISA GSA is Jim Russo and, and Gemma Howell from NIST. What I'll note is some of our objectives, right? Um, the things I'll note is that we share information to enable government adoption of secure mobile technologies. We identify and address uh, members' priorities and, and gaps and challenges uh, going forward. Um, and we also work on uh, those identification and addressing issues for the Fed CAO Council OMB agencies. Um, so there is both a organic, you know, uh, bottom-up approach, um, also a, a top-down uh, governance structure that's in place. Um, I'll mention, you know, our current membership is around 200 plus federal departments and agency uh, personnel, about 45 departments and agencies from the executive branch. Uh, so that, that is a focus of ours. And we meet uh, on a bi-weekly sort of, uh, I'm sorry, every two weeks, right? The first and third Tuesday of the month. Um, for industry, if you're trying to figure out, well, how do you engage? Um, I would recommend, uh, and we have this, we can also provide this out. You can find this on CIO.gov uh, if you look up uh, communities of, of interest, communities of practice listed there. But uh, wireless at GSA.gov is where we actually send everyone, both government and, and uh, industry. So we have areas, and, and I'll note, that cover four strategic pillars, right? And, and this is good from a, you know, government uh, sharing the information, knowledge, uh, lessons learned together, but also uh, what industry may have from a, you know, what is the latest and greatest in, in 5G technology in this case, right? Um, what is sort of fact versus myth? And, and how do we, uh, in industry as an example, how does industry support government to enable that mission, right? So um, the construct that we have in these four strategic pillars uh, really focus around uh, one, which is uh, mobile security. So think of things like FISMA, uh, think of things like uh, PIV drive credentials uh, and, and other aspects of, of enterprise mobility, uh, of mobile security. The other, the second pillar is around mobile acquisitions. Uh, you hear uh, Jim Russo talk a little bit about that and some of the accomplishments um, for, and, and sort of future vision going forward. And, um, and, and we work on everything from um, integrated data collection, so that, that category management piece with OFPP, um, uh, looking at uh, actually modernizing the data collection associated with it, showing value uh, added towards it, um, even uh, trying to tackle other topics and at least share information around things as it relates to Section 889, right, um, uh, for, uh, for, for us. Um, and what I also note, uh, another strategic pillar is around 5G and mobile network infrastructure. Uh, and this area, we, we do try to share a lot of what's going on in the space. Honestly, it's about, you know, it's somewhat like herding cats, but um, very much uh, all the disparate, uh, you know, efforts that are going on, we try to help make those connections, share information, share lessons learned, resources, you name it. Um, so you, you'll see a lot of great folks on the panels today that, that actually uh, in some form or fashion either participate or send their folks uh, to Federal Mobility Group and, and share that information. Uh, and then the last one uh, that we have with the strategic pillar is on mission enablement. So this is where we actually engage with industry, whether it's through ATARC or other forms of fashion, you can, you can email again, wireless at gsa.gov. Um, and we have this. So as an example, right, uh, during the pandemic, we wanted to know based on carriers and other ISPs, uh, what were they doing in order to ensure connectivity, you know, ensure that we have the, the resources available to, to complete our mission and very much a, a telework uh, environment as, as people went. Uh, and so we had briefings on that uh, coming in to talk about it. We also have educational series that go on within the, the 5G domain. Um, so there's, there's a lot of efforts there for engaging uh, with industry on emerging technologies or, or what's relevant sort of current day for enabling you know, the mission through, through mobile technologies. And then the other aspect of it is we do have the top-down approach. So if it doesn't fit into the other uh, three buckets that I mentioned, the strategic pillars, 
um, we actually have uh, an, an area where, you know, leadership says, hey, I need, you know, uh, what is Intune integration for, I'm sorry, uh, for uh, what is M365 integration for Intune as an example, right? So we, we wanted to look, scour across the federal space to understand what we're doing. And that's really where we, we sat as far as um, being able to complete that paper. Um, so, so I'll note, you know, those four strategic pillars are how we're constructed. We have everybody from, I mean, you name the three letter, four letter agencies, um, folks like Dave Harris from Department of Interior helping with those uh, FISMA efforts, folks like Cheryl Jenkins and Ross Ford, uh, one from GSA, another from CISA, working on the, the PIV drive credentials efforts uh, or drive PIV efforts. Um, we'll also have uh, folks like from uh, Betsy Cert from NASA Soup, right, uh, covering the, the acquisition portions. Uh, Joshua Weaver, which you're here, you'll hear talk today and introduce uh, Dr. Evans uh, covering the 5G, leading that effort uh, and that pillar. And then the last one uh, we have, uh, we had uh, USAID, I think it's going to switch over to State Department, but different groups that can help work this sort of cross the agency. So we do have a, a heavy footprint um, from the DoD, very much appreciate and, and welcome the partnership. And then the, the federal civilian executive branch also is, is represented uh, quite, quite well. So with all of those four strategic pillars, I'll note some, some recent accomplishments or accomplishments so far to date, right? Where you want to plug in or why you may care, whether from a department or agency or specifically from uh, industry, right? So as an example, you know, FISMA and that governance body that, that happens through the, the FEDSEO Council and, and OMB, you'll see that FISMA, as it's required to report on, um, there, there is aspects of metrics for mobility, right? Uh, and what I would note is it's this group that works together, uh, not only with the, the system owners or right, people who own and operate uh, enterprise mobility programs in federal departments and agencies, but more importantly, we also have that reality check with industry, right? So if we're recommending an allow or deny, deny list for mobile, you know, for mobile apps on a, on a GFE device, um, you'll see that we work together as a group to accomplish this. So whether it's back in FY20, FY21, or in the future FY22, uh, those metrics that are being recommended and proposed, there's an entire process, this group works that, right? Whether it's uh, to support uh, adoption, so we have various artifacts we've collected, especially sharing government to government, on where people are at or, or what are some of the best practices. Yes, we, we have a great alignment with NIST, um, and, and recommending those uh, as we follow those uh, NIST standard special pubs. Um, but more importantly, what are the artifacts that departments and agencies have deployed to ensure, you know, derived PIV credential enablement, right? Um, so those are the types of things that we do to support as an accomplishment. Um, in, the, in the acquisition, mobile acquisition space, I can tell you that we have identified um, uh, and consolidated the integrated data collection uh, efforts. So it used to be around 15 metrics. I think it's down to nine. And this is really a reporting burden uh, potentially to departments and agencies, right? Um, how many devices or endpoints do you have? Um, and, you know, all, all those efforts. And so you'll see us talk about, uh, you, you'll see us mention the accomplishments in this area, um, but very much uh, more towards the future. So we, we've pushed to modernize that information, try to make it more relevant to departments and agencies. So great piece. Um, okay, next one is uh, is uh, the five G effort. You'll hear Josh talk about that as far as the recent paper uh, that was done in in uh, going forward for uh, the framework to conduct five G testing and uh, and mission enablement paper. In general, we'll, we'll cover some of the additional accomplishments. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and switch it over to uh, Jim Russo, who can cover the IDC piece and acquisition. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Vince. I'm Jim Russo, um, Branch Chief of Solutions Development in the Enterprise Technology Solutions Directorate within GSA. And as uh, Vincent and um, Gemma has already mentioned, I'm one of the FMG co-chairs. Uh, I'll also be moderating the industry panel coming up a little later this morning, and uh, I hope you stick around for that because we've got some uh, top-notch folks on that panel. Um, as you heard from Vincent, you know, one of the pillars of the FMG is the acquisition uh, focus. The working group has delivered several resources um, over the you know, past little bit. Um, that includes a mobility categories and acquisition options um, document, which uh, was also um, done with a webinar uh, defined and highlighted mobility products 
and services available and the sources of supply for federal agencies. Um, and Vincent also mentioned the IDC data collection um, and the, uh, uh, the value of that. Uh, you know, IDC is short for Integrated uh, Data Collection. Uh, it's a government-wide mobility data call, and we collect it from all federal agencies and it's required by OMB. Um, the objective really is to use that data um, you know, within the FMG and for the agencies to um, you know, make educated decisions on how they're going to manage and run their individual agency mobility programs. Um, we've been collecting this for a while. Um, Vincent mentioned the nine elements. The primary uh, reason for those are to uh, you know, sort of focus on you know, what's the combined federal mobile inventory? You know, in, no, in other words, devices and spend. Um, what's the adoption rate of 5G capable devices? Um, what about emergency preparedness within individual agencies? What devices, infrastructure, wireless priority service, et cetera, do we have to bring to, uh, to events? And finally, what contract vehicles are primarily used by the agencies to buy mobile services? You know, in addition to what we have at GSA with the mobility schedule, there's also uh, strong um, acquisition options available from NASA, the NASA SOUP um, contract, the uh, Navy Spiral 3, uh, Army Chess, NIH. So there's a number of uh, options out there for agencies to engage. Um, the, uh, I guess the final point I want to make is that, uh, you know, the offerings have gone past just you know, wireless carrier services and devices. Um, you know, as we move into 5G and we move into a more robust mobility landscape, um, you know, our contracts also offer um, enterprise mobility management, device as a service, telecom expense management services, managed mobility services, mobile app vetting, mobile threat defense, mobile identity management, internet of things, mobile application development and platforms and other ancillary mobile equipment. So it's really a full set of acquisition solutions that um, our team makes available to the government uh, agencies at large. Um, so uh, thanks for a few minutes to discuss that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Josh Weaver. Um, he's the lead for the 5G pillar, as Vincent mentioned, and he'll close out this discussion of the FMG and introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Evans. All right, thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, like like uh, Vincent said, yeah, I'm a telecom engineer for the U.S. Navy, uh, doing you know all things wireless across the department, uh, primarily focused in R and D. Um, one of the other hats I wear is I, I lead this uh, uh, 5G pillar of the Federal Mobility Group. Uh, so since the interagency uh, FMG 5G group kicked off back in 2019. We've produced a number of uh, data products aimed at helping the federal government gauge the impact and opportunities and use cases enabled by 5G and uh, kind of an attempt to uh, grease the skids and, and expedite the adoption and rollout of uh, 5G technologies in the federal government. <clears throat> uh, so we kicked off with two parallel efforts, uh, the first being an analysis of uh, about 60 uh, federal regulations and policies uh, pertaining to 5G networks and how they may uh, impact agency plans. Uh, for implementing 5G services. And then the, the second white paper uh, was uh, the result of conducting a national tour of government commercial and, and a, uh, academic 5G labs. Uh, and of course, we got hit with the COVID-19 pandemic, which effectively ended the physical tours, uh, but we were able to survey a healthy mix of labs, uh, including those operated by equipment manufacturers and then the, uh, the, you know, the major carriers, uh, as well as federal government labs and uh, academic uh, institutions. <clears throat> Uh, and then they, they each have their unique focus areas. So the, the white paper describes the capabilities of the various labs visited and the types of labs best suited for different uh, uh, approaches to 5G uh, testing. Uh, those first two uh, documents are uh, FOUO, uh, but you can find them on ombmax.gov uh, with your uh, government credentials. Um, and then building on both of those, we pr uh, produce and uh, recently publicly published on cio.gov uh, a framework to conduct 5G testing a document which guides agencies through a few 5G use cases and advises users on uh, what should be considered when establishing a uh, 5G test capability or whether you build or, or buy. Uh, so, uh, and then finally, you know, after that, we've uh, partnered with the Networking and Information Technology Research and Development Program 
uh, and the Advanced Wireless Test Platforms Group, and we'll be hosting an event next week, actually, uh, a two half day event, or two, two half days um, for the event, uh, where we'll apply uh, that framework to conduct 5G testing to two use cases and, and kind of walk through it uh, and, and what that would look like for an agency to actually use the framework. <clears throat> so uh, there'll be a link in the chat for more information and, and registration if you're interested in attending that. Uh, with all of that said, uh, it's now my esteemed pleasure to announce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Joe Evans. Uh, he is the principal director for the DOD's 5G to Next G program, which is run out of the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. <clears throat> Uh, he oversees and directs the department's 5G experimentation and prototyping and, and coordinates 5G activities across the department. Uh, his, uh, his list of career accomplishments is far too great for me to, to fully detail here uh, today, but uh, prior to his current role, he was a, a distinguished professor of electrical engineering, uh, leading efforts in adaptive networks and spectrum sharing. Uh, he also has uh, prior federal government experience. Uh, as a program director for the National Science Foundation, uh, wireless networking efforts, as well as a, a program manager for DARPA's Strategic Technology Office, uh, overseeing several programs uh, from hardening technical networks to be secure and resilient to uh, spectrum situational awareness and, and spectrum sharing. So uh, he, he brings a lot to the table and, and, and applying all of that uh, experience to, to the 5G program. So we're, we're happy to have him. And uh, with that, I'll hand the, the, this virtual mic over to Dr. Evans, sir. Great. Thank you, Josh. I mean, I think I have a few slides. Like, great. It looks like uh, I guess I can can share them. Um, why, why don't we go to slide two? And um, hopefully, this will be a visionary uh, visionary talk as as advertised. Um, but really, what I want to do is is uh, share some of the the vision of what we're doing uh, with the the DoD five G to next G initiative, and um, you know some of the progress, and uh, you know what to expect over the next next few months. Um, and then moving forward. So really the o overarching um, um, goal of the 5G uh, initiative within DoD is to reinvigorate the telecom leadership that's the foundation of the US networked way, way of work. Um, as uh, you know, uh, warfare has evolved over the past few decades, we're increasingly uh, using uh, networked uh, drones, networked sensors, those types of, of capabilities in order to, uh, you know, to accomplish the mission. Um, uh, you know, underlying that is, is a foundation of, of uh, telecom, and we need to ma make sure that um, we have uh, capabilities there, um, you know, from the hardware, software on up to services that uh, can support, you know, this uh, way we are moving forward um, with our, our uh, way of, of thinking about warfare. So the, uh, uh, and that's why DOT cares about, about 5G. Um, so the uh, uh, two overriding objectives here are first win at the 5G technology fight, and we have two parts of the program that are, that are looking at that, accelerate and innovate, and then also win at the security fight, um, and we call, call that operate through. So I'll go through, through those here and, uh, one by one. So um, in terms of um, uh, the accelerate thrust area, what we're really trying to do is to accelerate the uh, use of 5G within DoD and our expertise with 5G through at scale prototyping and experimentation efforts. And the, the little thumbnail pictures there on the, on the right of the slide uh, illustrate um, the first five of those um, prototyping and experimentation um, efforts. Um, what we're really trying to do is, is what we call a, a value chain attack. And so uh, the uh, US has long uh, been, um, uh, has excelled at the high end of the value chain. So, um, you know, think, uh, think applications and services that use networked capabilities. Uh, uh, an example I like to give from 4G is Uber. You could not have an application or a service like Uber unless you had the connectivity provided by, by 4G. We're trying to find the killer apps for 5G for, for DoD and um, help seed that high end of the value chain, make sure the U.S. Uh, and its allies remain dominant in that part of the, of the ecosystem. Down at the lower end of the value chain is the, the, the hardware and the, the radio access network. And what we really wanna do there is help commoditize uh, the radio access network um, uh, via open interfaces so that there is more uh, competition, greater vendor diversity within the radio access network and really throughout the, the 5G uh, protocol uh, stack. Um, we think that that will be a, a great advantage to um, companies um, uh, in the U.S. and, the, and uh, with its uh, allies and partners, 
And it's frankly riding a trend that is happening anyhow. So again, this is accelerating um, what's, what's happening in the, uh, in the 5G world. The second uh, thrust area is uh, focused on security. And it's really, we call it operate through, it's really being able to operate uh, through or over uh, untrusted networks. And obviously we wanna exclude untrusted vendors where possible, but we also wanna make um, the market manipulations irrelevant being, by being able to work over those untrusted networks. And why we wanna do that is because when DOD deploys and it deploys you know, anywhere, anytime, um, um, when it deploys, um, you know, we want to be able to use whatever is available in that, that environment if we can. And so uh, a good analogy that a, a colleague of mine, uh, Don, uh, Dan Massey likes to, to make is that um, when we uh, you know, uh, go and deploy in a, in a country, it's not like we you know, replace the entire road system. We, we use what's, what's there um, as, much as, as much as we can. And so similarly with uh, networks, we'd like to be able to use those, uh, those um, networks as much as we, we can. So that's operate through non-secure networks. Then the third thrust area is what we call innovate, which is you know, how do we win at 6G and, and beyond? How do we make sure that the foundation is there so that um, you know, once we've uh, uh, you know, gotten, gotten uh, you know, uh, folks excited and using 5G, well, what comes next? We're ready to, uh, to excel at uh, 6G and beyond. And so uh, as, cro as cross-cutting activities, we're also reinforcing these thrusts with standards activity and um, international partnerships uh, with our uh, allies and uh, partner nations. Next slide, just briefly uh, talks about the um, uh, DoD 5G strategy. The DoD 5G uh, strategy and its implementation plan are available. Um, uh, they're uh, unclassified documents uh, and they are available on the uh, cto.mil uh, website. So if you'd like to download those and, and see um, how the strategy um, you know, is put together and you know, what we're doing in each of these areas, um, you, can, you can go to cto.mil and, and uh, take a look. Next slide uh, talks a little bit about um, some of the, the uh, accelerate thrust act activities. And I'll give you a little update on where we are on, on these. So um, in the, uh, what we call the first tranche of bases, tranche one bases, uh, the Hill Air Force Base, Joint Base Lewis McCord, uh, Naval Base, I should say Coronado, uh, and then um, uh, Marine Corps Logistics Base, Albany, Georgia. Uh, we have um, you know, stood up those, those uh, um, programs at each of those, those areas, many projects over um, you know, 36, uh, you know, three dozen prime, prime contractors and over 100 sub, subcontractors. So a large effort at those, those uh, um, tranche one bases. Uh, um, we have a, a, a tranche one lead, um, uh, Keith Gremben, who has been uh, working with the bases to get them, them uh, rolling. Um, we uh, are you know, starting to sta stand up the test beds at, uh, at all these, these sites um, and uh, uh, you know, start to perform um, uh, experimentation. Um, of these sites, um, you know, a variety of, of uh, technologies being used in, and vendors being used in uh, each of those, those testbed networks. Um, the Tranche 1.5 effort is at Nellis Air Force Base, and um, that uh, uh, was required in the NDAA. That's uh, why it came along a little bit later. Um, but uh, basically, uh, the Nellis project is looking at distributed command and control, and we're, we're very excited about, about that because it's a, an opportunity to see how this will directly impact the warfighter by uh, using the 5G network to take uh, command and control functions, a combined air operations center that's uh, long been a, a centralized function, distribute it into um, you know, mobile you know, vans or trucks, and then um, you know, have a nomadic network that can move around to be more survivable. Um, uh, eventually, hopefully, truly uh, uh, mobile, but uh, um, you know, certainly uh, nomadic in the, within the first couple phases of that, that effort. The uh, uh, Trunch 2 efforts uh, are just uh, standing up. The uh, uh, ones at uh, Naval Base Norfolk, uh, Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam and Associated Bases, and uh, at Camp Pendleton are uh, furthest along, and you've probably uh, seen uh, calls for white papers, and we're just uh, uh, in the process of getting uh, solicitations out for um, those sites uh, right, right now. 
the other sites are, are coming along uh, as as well. Uh, my guess would be the uh, next one um, out would be Joint Base uh, San Antonio, which is uh, 5G core capabilities and, and security. So starting to look at what you can do with things like um, uh, uh, network function virtualization and slicing and how you can make sure that uh, uh, you know, core capabilities are, are redundant, redundant and survivable. So uh, that's probably the ne next one um, out. Uh, then to be followed by, by uh, the Army projects as, uh, uh, as well as uh, the uh, Kinder Air Force Base immersive uh, training and education effort. The next slide talks a little bit about what we have at, at each of the each of the sites and, and the way we've been viewing this. And so really been viewing it as, a, as a three parts at each, each site. One is the test bed it, itself. Um, and that's very much dependent on you know, what the application is at that test bed at that site. Um, the uh, 5G application, and then uh, what we call network enhancements or you know, kind of going beyond the basic test bed capability. So in, the terms, in terms of the, the 5G test beds, a variety of vendors, as I mentioned, uh, different radio configurations, and those can be low band, mid band, um, or um, high band, uh, which would mean um, you know, millimeter wave, um, depending on the, the particular problem you're trying to solve. So for example, in some of the warehouse uh, activities, we're trying to see if we can use uh, millimeter wave within that, that uh, um, confined um, uh, environment. But we're also interested in, in uh, similar types of things in things like the Camp Pendleton experiment where millimeter wave might be a um, advantage in terms of uh, being more, more uh, survivable. Um, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, different um, uh, configurations of uh, core functions as well as backhaul options as well. Um, for certain types of, of experiments like the ones at um, uh, Nellis Air Force Base, looking at distributed command and control. We've also been experimenting with cells and light trucks. So the idea is that you can move that 5G cell site uh, around, um, and that has obvious um, advantages in terms of uh, survivability and, and, and so forth. Um, in terms of the applications, a uh, variety of applications, different ones at each, each site, ranging from command and control to use of uh, um, augmented reality, uh, capabilities for, for a variety of ty types of things, a 5G connected uh, augmented reality to um, experiments in smart warehouses and logistics inventory control. Um, some of the things that are um, uh, uh, analogous to uh, or parallel to some of the things that are happening in the uh, private um, you know, commercial world in terms of, uh, of um, private enterprise networks, 5G private enterprise networks you know, say within a, a warehouse or a factory floor, um, these uh, many of these applications are, are very similar in, in philosophy. And 5G network enhancements are, are essentially evaluating some of these uh, new cutting edge capabilities such as network slicing, uh, function virtualization, things like, things like that. Next slide um, talks a little bit about a, a couple of the other thrust areas and just gonna give you a quick idea of what we're do, doing there. Um, in terms of uh, operate through, which is remember the security related uh, aspect of the overall initiative, we have, um, uh, we're looking at it in, in two pieces. One is enabling 5G operations to securely operate across in, in, in indigenous commercial networks um, uh, you know, mixed with um, uh, military 5G uh, networks. And then the other piece is assessing risks, looking at uh, risk assessment and uh, tools and techniques to understand various, various challenges. Um, we're doing this in, in different pieces um, with different organizations in part because some of this work um, is classified. Um, and so we're working with uh, various network uh, or, or various uh, interagency partners um, ranging from uh, um, on, the, on the very unclassified side uh, with the National uh, uh, um, uh, Science Foundation to uh, at the other end, um, some uh, of the DOD uh, service uh, labs and other um, uh, organizations across the interagency that do classified work. Uh, the other uh, thrust area is, is a little bit, bit smaller, um, uh, Innovate uh, Beyond 5G. So this is looking at a variety of uh, cutting edge um, uh, new uh, capabilities that would be particularly beneficial to, to uh, DOD. So 
we are um, you know, issuing multiple solicitations from different organizations. One of those, uh, we are working very closely with our interagency partners at uh, the National Science Foundation on Innovate Beyond, Beyond 5G and are very excited about some of the solicitations that are, are just coming out uh, now. Next slide. Um, talks a, a bit about uh, some other things we're doing. Certainly we're investigating um, multinational collaboration with uh, organizations such as, as NATO. Um, but also uh, looking at bilateral uh, shared interests and uh, projects. Um, um, for example, we have an ongoing effort already stood up uh, with, with Estonia looking at, uh, at um, you know, uh, particular aspects of, of uh, network um, uh, design. Um, and then um, uh, industry model consortium, most of our initial solicitations to the National Spectrum Consortium also working with the uh, Information Warfare Research Program Consortium uh, on uh, the Tranche 2 efforts, as well as the Tranche 1.5 effort, and also looking at National uh, Security Technology Accelerator, NSTXL. Um, just want to point out that, that uh, um, you know, some of this uh, working through multiple consortia is uh, probably confusing and uh, uh, irritating to industry. Uh, however, uh, really, the, the issue is being able to go quickly and by uh, going through multiple uh, contracting um, uh, shops, we can more effectively, uh, you know, get projects stood up quickly. Uh, hopefully, in the end, benefiting both uh, DOD and um, and industry. And next slide, just uh, 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 talks about uh, what we're trying to do in Open Five G. So. Um, when we say open 5G, we mean open interfaces, not necessarily open source, although that's okay. Um, uh, you know, part of, of uh, what we're doing here, we've been working with, uh, with DARPA, with uh, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Smith's uh, Ops 5G program. So we have a partnership with, with uh, DARPA on this, but we're also looking at the idea of an open 5G uh, challenge um, uh, because we want to build uh, vendor diversity in this space, and that's a way to reach out to many, many different vendors and give them an opportunity to uh, to succeed. We issued a notice of inquiry. Uh, NTIA really issued it, uh, um, uh, and uh, we've been uh, working with them on evaluating the responses and putting together, you know, the structure of what this uh, Open Five G challenge will will look like, and hoping hoping to get a solicitation out for that um, very very quickly. Uh, because we really think that this will help to enable end-to-end -end experimentation. Um, it will uh, accelerate U.S. involvement in 5G and beyond 5G standards and provide the vendor diversity that, uh, that DOD um, you know, needs in order to support our um, you know, telecom, and, telecom and networking needs as we move into the, into the future. And then I think the last slide here is just uh, um, you know, kind of summing up our, our interests in, in 5G. You know, we think that this is vitally important because 5G is not just faster cell phones, it's also the other things like low latency and um, massive scale for co connecting uh, Internet of Things types devices, sensors, as well as uh, um, autonomous vehicles, uh, robotics. And so we think that this is vitally important because it will underlie the future of, of what DOD uh, needs to do to uh, fight and win. Um, we also believe that uh, this isn't going to end with 5G. We need to start looking at the next Gs, such as 6G and, and uh, beyond, um, because these technologies are, are crucial for economic homeland and, and national security. And with that, I will um, hand it back over. Thank you, Dr. Evans. That was a great keynote. Really enjoyed that. I know you're really busy with all the happenings around 5G, and uh, thank you for taking time out of your day. And I'd like to thank Gemma and Nick, who couldn't make it, and the rest of the FMG leadership uh, for the welcome remarks and the role of FMG's role in the government. And my name is Tom Suter. I'm the founder and president of ATARC, the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. And we have 32 project teams. Uh, we started out with the mobile working group. That was a, our first partnership. And it really goes back to the digital government strategy of 2012. It's hard to believe it was uh, released in January of 2012. I remember 
it was uh, in Las Vegas and I, I was there. So it's the longest in, uh, working group that we've had. It's been the model for the rest of the working groups and the project teams that we have. And uh, really enjoyed working with this group uh, for the last eight years, eight, nine years. But anyway, uh, ATARC, we, uh, we're a nonprofit organization that facilitates got collaboration between government, industry, and academia in order to accelerate technology modern, modernization in initiatives, including 5G, of course. And we provide ongoing opportunities for cross-agency collaboration through on-site and digital interaction, learning, and market research. Through participation in in-person and virtual events, working group forums, and access to informational resources, ATARC offers its community a trusted environment for meaningful thought leadership exchange. So today we have a great program for you with two panels, another keynote, and to finish it off, we've planned three collaborative breakout sessions. And we used to do these in person. We called them the MITRE collaboration sessions. So we're excited to kind of start to do these virtual, which we think will be very, very interesting to you. Um, so anyway, our first uh, panel topic focuses on 5G and the federal government, where you will hear the impact of 5G on the government now and expected benefits in the future. We've got uh, CISA representative, a couple of folks from the Department of Defense and National Science Foundation, and it'll be moderated by Vincent Sridipan, who is the Cyber Quizmo Section Chief um, for Mobile in uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. And the second panel will bring more of an industry perspective on the various aspects of the 5G rollout and what they can, uh, what use cases they can imagine in the federal spaces. So we'll have some folks from AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Mattel. And uh, it's gonna be moderated by the very capable Jim Russo, who's the Branch Chief Solutions Development at uh, General Services Administration. And Jim's a favorite of the program. He's probably been on more webinars than anybody else. So. Uh, this time he has a chan chance to work with us in moderating. And then after that, we will hear from Alan Hill, Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Category Management, uh, acting at GSA. And Alan is an operator. He's worked inside of agencies. Um, he was he worked uh, in the Air Force, and he brings a really good technical perspective. Um, so you'll he'll be a great keynote to close. And then we're going to have these breakout sessions, um, collaborative breakout sessions led by MITRE. And ATARC and MITRE perform, partnered many times over the years, authored many joint white papers. And uh, the great thing about MITRE is, is you know, I'm having authored white papers myself, it's a lot of work. They raise their hands. They can't wait to do these. And it's uh, very enjoyable. And it's a great process if you haven't had a chance to do it before. And I'm really interested to see how it works um, collaboratively uh, through uh, remotely. So, uh, Great pleasure. We are bringing today this great collaboration platform to you digitally. Um, all of you should have instructions and access links for these breakout sessions in your event confirmation emails. We will post them up for you in the chat box at the end of this program around noon again. Uh, so you can easily copy and paste and, and enter there. And if, as always, if you have any problems, just let our team know. The sessions are going to be 5G test beds, 5G security, 5G R&D. Each session will be led by two federal 5G experts and a MITRE moderator. We invite you to be interactive, chime in, ask questions, or participate actively. This is a uh, off the record, so uh, you feel free to, uh, you're not gonna be attributed, and uh, we just want good, honest conversation in these. That's usually how they really work the best and with everybody participating. Um, I thank you all for joining us today. I hope you will enjoy the program, and I will now turn it over to Vincent to kick off the first panel. Awesome, great, thank you. Um, so just double checking, I know we're running a little early now, so uh, uh, just double checking that uh, Serena, uh, see Dr. Simit Roy, uh, Dr. Dan Massey, and um, sister, uh, Dr. Thiaga Nandakapol, if you guys can, uh, if you can all turn on your cameras, that would be great. And I'm just going to double check, uh, make sure we have everybody. Okay, so I think we do, and this view makes it uh, even easier. So I can't see everybody, but it's okay. All good stuff. All right. So um, thank you very much. It's a it's a pleasure to have uh, the, our esteemed guests on the panel here today. Um, we do have uh, just to to recap real quick, and, and the the purpose of today's panel, just to be clear, is. One, we have, as you mentioned, uh, as, as Tom mentioned before, 
a, a 5G panel specifically about federal government and, and just government only. You'll see the next one is, is very much industry panel led by Jim Russo. And what we want to talk to here about today, it really is understanding some of the challenges uh, within 5G and then how we may over address them and overcome them. And then what is the future entail, right? So um, just to start off, uh, we have with us uh, Ms. Serena Reynolds. Uh, she's the Chief for Innov Initiatives Management Branch within CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. We have Dr. Dan Massey, he's the program lead for 5G to Next G initiative, as you heard, the operate through. Um, that, that's very much uh, Dr. Dan Massey with DOD OUSD r &E. We have also Dr. Sumit Roy. Uh, he is the Beyond 5G, uh, in this case, uh, initiative lead. Uh, and in, uh, again, with DOD OUSD r &E. And then lastly, we have Dr. Thiaga Nandakapol. Uh, he is the Deputy Division Director at the National Science Foundation. So welcome, everybody. Um, just to start off, if you could, uh, uh, just to start off, if you could, um, I want to take a couple minutes, let folks introduce themselves and talk about sort of why 5G is important to you, right? And um, how does that impact your role, your job, your responsibilities in the organizations you're with? Uh, so starting off, uh, Serena, if you'd like to. All right. Thanks, Vince. Thanks for having me. Appreciate uh, being here today. Um, I'm Serena Reynolds. I'm the initiative manager. I, I, I head up things um, uh, initiatives that we call them within NRMC across uh, the different critical infrastructures. They hit everything from transportation to public health. We look at elections, uh, pipeline security, and the biggest one that we're kind of talking about today is 5G. And really from my perspective, I feel like 5G is probably the biggest critical infrastructure development that we've seen, at least in the last couple of decades. We know that it'll certainly introduce uh, new technologies and really transform the way we communicate um, looking at the scope of 5G, we've really, within CISA, placed an increased focus on managing risks. Um, and certainly coming from the National Risk Management Center, that's sort of the lens that we're looking at it. Um, and certainly the touch points that 5G has with the different areas of critical infrastructure, um, remote healthcare, telecommunications, um, the sensitive military and government facilities piece that um, Joe hit on earlier, mass transit, and really looking at the scale of where 5G will kind of change the nature of the risks posed to our national critical functions, which is another area that we kind of look at as, as far as risk. And this really kind of spans across all the federal government. Um, and just really being able to understand these threats and vulnerabilities is really key to advancing 5G and providing um, the potential to really transform government operations and certainly within DHS, improve, improve critical infrastructure and really serve as a force multiplier for innovative technologies. So that's kind of the lens that we're looking at it from CISA. Great, thanks, Serena. Uh, Dr. Dan Massey, same question. Sure, great. Yep. Yeah, thanks Thanks for having us. So uh, yeah, now I'm, I'm part of the initiative that uh, uh, Dr. Evans just discussed. And so uh, as you can see, this is really important to DOD. We need to be able to operate across a number of environments. Uh, as, as Dr. Evans mentioned, I'm the lead for operate through. So we're particularly concerned with some of the security usages. And we're also concerned with how do we operate in, uh, in commercial environments. So uh, yeah, I, I know Joe mentioned this briefly already, but I'll, I'll just really quickly kind of repeat, you know, when we go in to do a mission, right, we aren't going to rebuild the road infrastructure, we aren't going to rebuild the power infrastructure, we're going to whenever possible rely on the existing infrastructure that's there. That's what we want to do and operate through. We want to come in and we want to say, hey, there's 5G infrastructure um, you know, emerging throughout the world. Can we make use of that infrastructure securely? Right? And that can be for everything from you know, our, our typical handset sort of communication to, you know, to command and control, to tactical systems. This is, uh, this is massively important across the, you know, across the DoD use cases. And, uh, and last thing there, you know, just like we say, you know, we're going to make use of existing roads and bridges. That doesn't mean we don't have our own capability, right? The Corps of Engineers can come in and, and build a span, build a bridge across the river anywhere in the world. Uh, we are going to be able to bring our own communication systems with us anywhere in the world. But we also want to leverage the infrastructure that's out there. And, and how do we do that is a, is a fascinating open question. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, Vincent. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Dr. Roy? Hi, uh, morning everyone. Thanks, Vincent. So um, just like my colleague, uh, Dan Massey mentioned, 
I'm a program lead for Innovate Beyond 5G uh, for the same organization, OUST R&D. Uh, you heard uh, Joe Evans uh, give a keynote earlier and set the context wonderfully for what we do. So um, as my program name suggests, which is Innovate, uh, my program is focused on uh, taking 5G as a standardized commercial technology and moving it forward. Now, um, let me offer a, a, a vignette of what that may possibly mean. Uh, in the, uh, the, the 5G to Next G program that is being funded through the, the, the initiative headed by Dr. Evans, a significant amount of federal funding is going towards uh, commercial vendors who will deploy a commercial grade, uh, grade 5G network. As you mentioned, several of these will be enterprise scale at these various DOD bases that have been picked in tranche one. Um, so commercial grade uh, 5G networks would be deployed at these bases. But what is of the greatest interest is that for the first time in, in, in history, uh, a commercial grade network uh, will be opened up, i.e. interfaces would be created. And hence, we call this a base prototype deployment uh, interfaces will be created to allow the kind of DOD inspired use cases. Each of the bases have, has a flagship DOD inspired use case. So uh, application performance and subsequently enhancers uh, would be able to bring their technology pieces, both hardware and software. And hence uh, the, the, the base prototype, uh, the base deployment would treat it as a prototype, would have to provide the interfaces for these uh, subsequent performers to test uh, these DOD-inspired use cases uh, and uh, you know, create advanced solutions. So our programs are watching this scheme because we are preparing uh, sort of in parallel an R&D, research development, engineering, and test agenda to be able to support this. Uh, if you wanted to reflect on the significance of this, Here's a few first. Uh, with DOD funding, uh, we are going to be able to see for the first time some unique experiments. Okay, so these are DOD inspired use cases, uh, which are not necessarily in the uh, timeline for commercial deployment by commercial industry. So it's DOD use cases, which will lead to innovation, uh, both through these um, uh, performers that I just mentioned. And, and, and actually test applications, which are going to be a first. And these are going to be the fuel for the programs that Dan and I uh, uh, lead. Uh, thank you, over. Great, thank, thank you, Dr. Roy. Um, and Dr. Uh, Tiaga Nandekapo. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here, Vincent. Uh, nice to meet you, Sena, Sumit, and Dan. Um, so from the National Science Foundation's perspective, uh, we are a science agency that is invested, uh, that seeks to invest in basic foundational research. Uh, and you know, in some sense, what we, uh, the story about 5G is not what we're going to do, but what would we have done? Uh, because you know, we have to be looking ahead all the time. So we started looking at 5G back in 2010, 11 timeframe. And the work that we see that has uh, become the bedrock of 5G deployments, whether it's millimeter waves or massive MIMO um, or share spectrum or all you know, things that NSF has invested in a lot. And uh, you know, the results of that is what we are seeing realized in 5G networks of today. That said, right, 5G is not like, you know, you do it once and you're done. Uh, what we do see, there is a gap, uh, not mainly in terms of access to, having a robust and uh, affordable uh, 5G network that, you know, that the rest of the country would like to have. We have solved the basic foundational technology challenges to some extent. In many of these cases, there remains more that needs to be solved. Uh, and from the NSF perspective, we are always looking at that, uh, what is the unsolved frontier? And we're trying to solve that. Uh, and a part of that is looking at ac creating access to our research community whether it is in the academic world or in the industry or in a federal lab space, uh, giving them access to cutting edge 5G testing systems. Uh, so we started a program back in 2016 called the Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research, which seeks to create four large test beds uh, that are city scale, uh, so to speak. So we have uh, this, these three, three of these test beds today up and running, uh, one in Salt Lake City uh, in Utah, the University of Utah campus, 
the other one in, uh, in Columbia, near the Columbia University campus in Harlem, uh, and then the third one in the North Carolina State University, which is focused on drones uh, and UAVs primarily, and the impact on wireless uh, issues there. So there's three test beds that are up and running. Uh, the fourth one is focused on uh, delivering affordable rural broadband access. We are expecting to announce that uh, within the next month or so. Um, so uh, these platforms, they are a great place for uh, you know testing out advanced concepts. And you know I I, I owe a lot of thanks to Joe uh, Evans who saw the potential of these platforms and started engaging uh, some of the programmatic work uh, that you know, he was doing, pursuing while at DARPA, and now at the, at the DOD. Uh, we are testing many of those concepts on the platform in Salt Lake City today. Uh, and we are hoping to engage uh, more uh, agency colleagues, interagency colleagues as well, uh, and see if the platforms can meet their testing needs on 5G. A big interest for NSF is uh, affordable access and the programmable access. Uh, programmable access is important, because you, you know, we cannot think that the standards have solved everything. Standards are indeed uh, written by people who are looking at issues at any given time, making the best decision and based on the information that they have at their disposal. And this information can change. And that's what research does. Research and development shows up new, brings up new issues. And we have to constantly uh, be adaptive and be willing to change or reflect them in the, in the standards. So we are hoping that by uh, allowing programmability in the network design, you know, people can muck around and play around with the different facets of the network and say, what works best? What have we not figured out in a practical setting? And say, what, is, what do we need to tweak to make things better? And then go back to the standards bodies and reflect them. So while 5G has another three rounds of standards to go and then potentially lead into what might become 6G or next G, uh, we think there is a lot of work that needs to happen. And uh, Programmable networks that we are designing as part of these test beds, the power test beds, are essentially designed to allow that kind of flexible experimentation all the way from the radio frequency layer uh, to the core network, right? So you have this uh, programmable, virtualizable substrate that anyone can uh, play around with. And a core to this is the support of open source. So these are built, many of the platforms are built using SDRs, right? They can also support quartz equipment, but Primarily by supporting SDRs uh, and software-defined networks, we are allowing any experimenter to come and uh, change the different parameters and the features of the system and redo the entire implementation if necessary, because they have access to the open source code that underlies these 5G network designs, right? So uh, again, this is not just 5G, right? They can also check 4G because to be honest, you're not gonna throw out the 4G network for many years to come. So you want to look at issues relating to not just purely 5G, but also compatibility with 4G networks and what kind of issues they come up with, both in terms of performance, security, reliability, and so on. And, uh, and our goal is to essentially allow these platforms to be uh, supportive of such experimentation that people may want to do, right? Uh, so that's, that's the 5G part of it. And we are keenly investing right now in the next generation uh, set of topics. Again, what comes next, right? So this is something that you know, we, we are looking out 10 years ahead and people are always wondering, you know, what's going to be the next iPhone? And yes, we hope that we will have an answer to the research that we fund. Uh, and uh, let's see what happens. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Vincent. Great, thank you. And so as you can see, uh, we have a great uh, speaker set here, um, both from the sort of the future side, but also the, the cybersecurity side of the house. Uh, so very much appreciate everybody from CISA, DOD, and NSF uh, on this panel. So specifically, I'll go into the, the sort of this uh, merged uh, question here, but uh, so where do you see 5G impacting your agency, but also when we think about it from impacting the warfighter, right? Or say state and local tribal territorial government agencies. I understand different people have different backgrounds and mission sets. So as we look at 5G and that impact, where do you see this uh, impacting that, that warfighter SLTT uh, government agencies? Uh, starting Serena? Sure. Um, we've done quite a bit of SLTT engagement um, over the last several months. We actually conducted three pilots, um, one in Washington, D.C., and as you can um, probably imagine, the, the intense uh, small geographic area coupled with uh, critical infrastructure, embassies with the international implications, um, and certainly universities and academia, there's a lot of implications, the federal um, government presence there, 
was certainly an area that we wanted to be able to examine. We also did one in Utah as tribal lands, a lot of rural areas, um, and then also Minnesota. And so just being able to have those um, conversations with the state and local government agencies was extremely important, bringing the interagency to kind of have policy discussions to really roll up our sleeves and, and, and sort out some of the, the, the policy considerations with 5G deployment, whether it be 5G 101 education and awareness, um, discussions on vendor diversity, international implications, um, and then certainly talking about risks. And we know that um, with 5G largely operating on a non-standalone network, um, it'll really rely on that existing 4G infrastructure to provide um, speeds and connectivity. And, and certainly as 5G is largely deployed and moves to its own standalone network, um, government agencies will really be able to experience more of the advanced benefits. Um, we certainly know that for some of the states being able to have the connectivity to be able to have that mission critical application piece is gonna be extremely important. We've talked about a lot of use cases to public safety, um, fire EMS, um, uh, PSAPs, NG911. Those sorts of benefits will be areas that I'm sure uh, state and locals are going to be very, very, very interested in. And certainly that increased capacity and connectivity that supports the sheer number of devices that will be on the network and certainly creating that possibility for smart, hyper-connected cities. We've had a lot of conversations with uh, university campuses, certainly out in Washington State, that are becoming a lot more connect connected. Um, smart hospitals and, and those sorts of applications have been things that have certainly come up in our discussions. And then, of course, with the enhanced mobile broadband um, and really being able to increase the speeds um, much faster than 4G and enabled uh, applications like augmented virtual reality and really being able to improve government operations and training capabilities. And I know DOD is certainly looking at that as well. Um, so we just wanted to be able to kind of go into the SLTT community to have some of those discrete conversations and help to be able to steer policy decisions and policy makers as they're starting to look at 5G adoption and they're having those engagements with the carriers to provide um, that education and awareness piece, but to also be able to plan for what 5G will bring um, to their state and local communities. Great, and just a, a selfish plug for, uh, for CISA is that uh, you can find a lot of the public material on cisa.gov forward slash 5G. So, so that just, uh, just a note there. So very much appreciate that, Serena. So uh, going to Dan, I guess from the warfighter perspective, whether it's current day or in the future, right? And, and either to, to Dr. Roy, to and others, um, where do you see this? How is has 5G having that impact potentially now and in the future for the warfighter? So, so really interesting impact on the, uh, on the warfighter. And I think uh, some of what we've already seen in the tranche one bases illustrate the breadth to which it's, it's impacting DOD operations. So if you look at what we're doing in tranche one, we've got, uh, we've got smart warehouses in both uh, Albany, Georgia and uh, Naval Base Coronado, right? And, and so you might, not, you might not have initially thought of 5G as enabling things like smart warehouses, but, uh, but the idea of massive scale, uh, the, the ability to, to communicate uh, you know, via those systems enable us to do things at a smart warehouse that you, know, you that are actually critical to DOD, but you might not have immediately thought of. A uh, couple other quick examples are, uh, of course, um, we also look at, as Dr. Evans mentioned, distributed command and control, right? So distributed command and control will be impacted by 5G. We're looking at augmented reality, virtual reality, how to, how to both better train and to eventually better operate uh, through work up at Joint Base Lewis McCord. And, um, and we're looking at spectrum sharing. And uh, I'll say from my operate through perspective, I'll throw out a couple other quick examples and then I'll pass it over to Dr. Roy. Um, you know, so I'm interested in things like uh, supply convoys. Right? So increasingly we have our vehicles connected. And so as we might be doing a supply convoy, whether it's from Albany, Georgia to Coronado or you know, Frankfurt to, to Tallinn or wherever it might be, that is increasingly a connected convoy may have some platooning, autonomous driving that's gonna rely on the system, that's gonna have some communication back and forth. So we have everything from the warehouses to the convoys to the augmented reality. Uh, two last missions and then I'll, then I'll be done here is, uh, you, know, think about, uh, you know, think about a humanitarian response mission, right? So we have to respond to a humanitarian disaster, you know, a disaster somewhere in the world and in that case, we not only need to have our own comm systems, but we need to work with NGOs, like maybe Doctors Without Borders. We need to work with um, 
you know, we need to work with local governments um, you know, who, who may not be, who are not adversaries, but may, may not be partners either. So interesting thing there. And then last use case is, uh, of course, uh, the Navy has a, a strong interest in, uh, in 5G deployments, whether that's communicating um, between ships and uh, whether that's devices on the, on the vessels. So, uh, you know, naval use cases for, for 5G are becoming increasingly important, and we see more and more of that in NATO discussions. So let me pass that over to, to Dr. Roy uh, to add a little bit more there. So thanks. Sure. Um, thanks, Dan. Uh, so just um, following on from what Dan said, perhaps a good way for your uh, uh, viewership or participants to think about uh, Dan's program, uh, which is operated through and mine, is for me to position myself between Dan and some of the key things that Tiaga mentioned, what NSF represents, you know, the interests in sort of core fundamentals. So, you know, if you look at what's going on behind the technology deployments at these bases, um, a lot of fundamental new technology uh, from uh, commercial vendors, uh, you know, some, uh, I mean, some commercial and some, uh, you know, DOD, uh, 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 you know, uh, users will be brought to test. And again, I wanted to reflect on the fact that, uh, you know, there's a lot of firsts that are going to be happening here. And, you know, I, I hope people appreciate the magnitude. So first off, you know, as already been mentioned, you know, the, the investment is, uh, is unleashing a lot of interagency collaboration first, uh, uh, you know, um, and people will see more and more announcements that reflect this. But essentially on the core technology, uh, here's what is really a, a, a first. A lot, while the, the DOD bases are driven by DOD use cases, a lot of core fundamental technology will enhance, will evolve. So the things that were mentioned already, you know, uh, moving in, in in the frequency bands to millimeter wave terahertz, uh, looking at scaling of MIMO, dynamic spectrum access, uh, true head nets. You know, often in the commercial world, head nets is is you know is meant to talk is meant is meant to, to imply integration of uh, cellular networks, but at different scales, you know, or 4G with 5G in this non-standalone mode. But we are really looking at from, uh, you know, a, a 5G and beyond 5G perspectives, as many of you will know, the integration of terrestrial, airborne, shipborne, undersea segments, uh, while inspired by DOD operations, these will impact the sort of core fundamental technologies that were mentioned that's, you know, traditionally NSF has funded, uh, you know, for, for, for already uh, a decade or more. These advances will be brought to bear in the applications and the enhancement level testing at the basis. So, uh, first of all, the, the, the enhancements to core technology, uh, you know, firmly is, you know, within, uh, uh, you know, our scope. So we'll be looking to, uh, uh, you know, fund uh, research, development, testing, prototyping, same as with NSF. So there's a natural coordination, but we'll be going further. We'll be looking at experimentation on these DOD assets, same as in parallel with some of the infrastructure that the National Science Foundation has. So in summary, there is a there is an effort to look at fundamentals. There's an effort to look at how this will impact, uh, you know, standards going forward. So as you know, Tiago already mentioned that you know standards are a reflection of the participants. Most of the participants, you know, are are you know from commercial companies, and they respond to the knowledge and the ROIs that their organizations represent. So, you know, folks like NSF and folks like DOD, which represents our organizational visions, bring necessary, uh, you know, uh, other necessary perspectives, you know, to this dialogue. And for the first time with DOD, as we say, coming into the game early. So what is, you know, the other first is, traditionally the government has been sort of a passive user, post facto of commercial technology. So, you know, and this is not just true of networking, it is true of IT, of software, microelectronics, all the other major, uh, you know, technology segments for which the government is a huge consumer, but we have largely been passive and we have waited for the commercial sec sectors to, 
you know, define, mature, you know, prototype, test this out, and then we seek to retrofit it. Here's a big first. You know, we are, as a DOD, we are, and NSF, we, you know, we are early in the game. And we are looking to actively, you know, uh, e e eat our own cooking, so to say, while uh, you know, while we participate in 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 funding and pro uh, early prototyping of these technologies, we are also seeking to influence the future. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and great great plug for for all the great work that DoD OUSDR is doing with Dr. Evans' leadership. Uh, okay. Uh, just going on to the next question here. So, and this is a little uh, challenging. So, can you, uh, anybody talk about uh, the top challenges your agency is facing when it comes to 5G? Um, and the other thing is, how do you plan to overcome that challenge, right? So, um, uh, I guess, uh, starting off with Serena, if you like. Sure. Um, within our CISA 5G strategy that we released last year, we wanted to kind of take a look at a lot of the challenges and the key concerns that our stakeholder community brought to us. And certainly looking within our own authorities, we identified five major areas that we wanted to focus on. One, attempts by threat actors to influence the design um, and architecture of the 5G network. Two, susceptibility of the supply chain piece um, and that malicious or inadvertent introduction of vulnerabilities. Um, three, also looking at uh, the deployments of 5G, leveraging legacy infrastructure and then trusted components that um, would certainly bring known vulnerabilities, limited competition in the 5G marketplace and the limited proprietary solutions that would also come with that from untrusted vendors is another area that we've looked at. Um, and as well as 5G technology um, and just the sheer number of devices being on the network that increase attack surface for malicious actors by introducing new vulnerabilities. And certainly we're looking at it um, from a physical security perspective as we've seen a lot of mismal and, and misinformation being um, share it across the internet on, um, you know, 5G causing COVID and other um, such areas, just really being able to educate the public on what the actual issues are. Um, and then the cybersecurity piece of physical, uh, as it relates to physical risk, and then the education and awareness um, has been extremely important. And so we've really been able to address these challenges um, by developing three core competencies. One, looking at things from a risk management perspective, looking at that cyber piece, uh, the physical piece and how it all comes together, really being able to articulate what the risk is, having those threat briefings, having those conversations, working with the SLTT communities, um, and helping to be able to drive policy and decision making within that um, has been extremely important. And then also creating an analytical capability where we're leveraging a lot of the great work that the Federal Mobility Group is doing, uh, the R&D um, that DOD is doing, and being able to allow that to feed a lot of the conversations that we're having as we're looking at 5G and beyond. The second piece is stakeholder engagement, and that is extremely important. Um, leveraging a lot of the great partnerships that we have, um, certainly with our industry members through our bodies such as NSTAC, um, Enduring Security Framework, and our uh, ICT Supply Chain Task Force, and really being able to have a lot of those conversations I know for the ICT um, supply chain task force, they're really migrating toward having a lot more robust conversations, introducing a lot more um, dynamic vendors um, within the conversations and, and shifting their focus to 5G uh, quite a bit more um, in the coming years. So the stakeholder engagement piece is extremely important. Um, the last piece I just wanna highlight a little bit is technical assistance. And that's really where we, uh, I talk a little bit about our state and local workshops. That's really where we go out and we provide um, targeted solutions to the stakeholder community, whether it be uh, cyber risk assessments, threat and vulnerability assessments, um, conversations around policies, strategic planning, um, and those sorts of elements to include governance and other areas. Basically anything that our community kind of brings to us as a challenge that they wanna be able to address within uh, strategic conversations and really being able to roll up our sleeves and come up with solutions. And so those are kind of the areas that we wanted to be able to kind of establish policy, legal security and safety frameworks to really put in place um, some real and robust um, 5G mitigation and threat and vulnerability, um, address those issues and really be able to have those conversations at a policy level. Great, thanks Serena. Yeah, and, and I really like the plug for sort of that cross collaboration interagency discussions. Um, the, the work that we do here within CISA um, shared across and even in the partnership with, with the research and development with Diaga, Sumit, Dan, and others. I mean, it really, it's good to have uh, awareness across the board. And so, so very much thank you for those comments. 
Uh, so so if for anyone else on the panel, if you want to go ahead and, and don't think of it just for 5G, it could be for what about beyond 5G, right? So what are those top challenges that your agencies are facing and, and how do you potentially overcome that, right? Um, anybody? Uh, so I can speak a little bit for the National Science Foundation. And again, you know, as we are we uh, as a as an agency that gives out 96, 95 percent of our dollars uh, budget uh, to as grants to the researchers, research community. I I, I want to kind of put it from the, from the perspective of what the research community faces. Right, uh, a big challenge with 5G uh, is this ongoing question about what is the killer app, right? You know, how do we sustain? the interest, the high level of investment that one needs to make into deploying a 5G network if there is no killer app that, uh, that's driving the demand for these networks. I, I think the, this is where I feel that the approach that what the DOD has taken uh, is very much tapping into the real benefit of 5G, which is to say you can create a custom network that suits your needs in a very localized instance, right? And for us, creating that demand uh, or trying to communicate that uh, that model saying, hey, this is what 5G networks really are. This is not like a nationwide network that you're going to see on your phone and say, oh, 5G, therefore things are going to be different. As an enterprise operator, as somebody who's running an enterprise, you have the option to instantiate and customize your own network to meet your own mission needs. Uh, and again, taking that from the realm of uh, DoD, where mission needs are very well defined and there is uh, a, you know, a great desire to meet those goals where things can become a little bit more softer, right? We wish we could have kind of a model uh, that you see in the private industry. That has been a little bit of a challenge for our academics to think through because you know, they would love to see more 5G deployments happen because with greater use cases, you get more interesting uh, research questions to answer. Uh, and we are somehow trying to figure out how do we communicate this message that 5G is not the kind of it's, the, it's not the network that only Verizon's or at and or Sprints can deploy or t mobiles can deploy, but rather anyone should be able to get into the game, right? You can have a small small operator who wants to create something for a, a regional a region, like a small part of a city and say, I'm gonna have a 5G network here and I'll figure out the backend, but I can create a customized 5G instance for you. Trying to work with that model, get that word out, uh, can lead to much more, uh, uh, interesting choices for what killer apps might look like. So that I think is uh, a big 5G specific challenge that we are facing. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Roy, any thoughts? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, thanks Vincent. So yeah, let me let me uh, make uh, you know, Tiaga's uh, comments uh, concrete with an example. Uh, you know, for a long time, both uh, um, NSF and DOD, you know, we have worked in different lanes and uh, you know, uh, the, 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 one of the challenges that, that, you know, we would both jointly like to address is the fact that there's a core technology base that serves the sort of the broad civilian markets that, uh, you know, by and large NSF's funding supports, as well as the mission specific mission critical use cases that, you know, DOD represents. Now here for the first time, you're probably seeing the possibilities of, of convergence. So let's, let's take an example that, you know, with uh, uh, say, uh, the, you know, broad-based uh, civilian funding, um, you know, 5G networks as, as defined by 3GPP or any of these, in, you know, uh, in the, the international standards organization evolved in a particular manner, responding to say sort of the marketplace that you know, Tiago mentioned, you know, what is the, the major app driving the evolution? So here comes DOD. And you know we have our you know those mission critical applications where we would like these same technologies but deploy it for a much more ad hoc tactical you know autonomous uh, uh, network scenarios right because uh, you know it, 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 very simply uh, DoD's network have both uh, need to be proactive use a lot of information for the kind of unknown, as we say, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns, you know, as we deploy it. Many people in one sentence forget that the DOD and in some sense is a multinational, just like all our other corporations who operate globally. 
people just forget that DOD is for homeland defense. It is not. So, and so it's just like a multinational everywhere, right? And it has, in a sense, the same marketplace imperatives, or well, it has the same marketplace to play with as you know multinationals, but with different imperatives. So let's take those same problems and look at how we will plan or operate uh, networks. We have to be, you know, best use the information that we have before, you know, to, to deploy and operate through conditions with, you know, great amount of, you know, or a varying amount of uncertainties. And then once we deploy, we have to adapt. So the kind of the roles of network intelligence and autonomy, the two key features that we see, you know, defining 5G and beyond, these applications will be both, we all believe will absolutely be driven by 5G. But in order to achieve this, the kind of technology components that are mentioned, you know, the softwareization, virtualization, you know, on the software side, as well as in the hardware platforms, the SDR is now based on MIMO, going in frequency, higher bandwidths, and, you know, all the other innovations that we talk about, integrating a terrestrial with non-terrestrial network segments, true HetNet, uh, you know, integration. These will be first tested in this kind of localized deployments. So for the first time, both of us see a possibility for dual use that, you know, literally for the first time, commercial vendors are looking at this opportunity to, you know, be inspired by a DOD use case and see a longer term horizon for their technology. Similarly, DOD vendors who always thought of the government being the only consumer are saying, hey, if we create some technology, we can thereafter go and license it to a commercial entity down the road. So they, therefore they have an incentive to you know, create IP and protect you know, their inventions for not just the government, but for you know, broader civilian use. So this, you know, the, the, the seeding and the you know, hopefully reaping the benefits down the line of creating true dual use possibilities. I see both uh, you know, a, a, a fabulous challenge and an interest. I mean, obviously, opportunity for for both you know, both the civilian and the and the and the government specifically of DoD. Thank you. Awesome. And Dan? Yeah, absolutely. So I you know I think some great points by all the panelists. Uh, I just want to add in. I agree with all those positions. I want to just add in one crucial piece, uh, which Serena touched on a little bit, which is this only works if we can make it secure. Right, whether it's critical infrastructure, uh, you know, state, local, tribal, government, uh, and especially DOD, if we don't have the security, all this great technology is, is really not of much value to us. Right? And, and when I talk about security, you know, our security folks here, right, we, we typically think just in terms of uh, you know, encryption, uh, integrity, that sort of thing, we can do that, right? And we're doing that and there's important work to be done there. But I want to kind of push that boundary to get the full spectrum of security to say, hey, you know, you know, in security, we often talk about CIA confidentiality, integrity, availability, right? Uh, let's think about that availability and let's think about some of the other confidentiality issues we might not normally consider. Uh, so one interesting one for us is the what's often called the, the pizza delivery to the Pentagon problem, right? And so in this case, let's assume the data is perfectly encrypted. But how much can I infer about operations just by watching the pattern of communication? The analogy here is if I was sitting on the roof of the, the Pentagon City Mall across from the, the Pentagon and just watching food deliveries into the Pentagon, how much can I tell about operational tempo? So how much can I observe just about observing our, our 5G comms tempos? Um, the other interesting question here, and, you know, and a lot of the panelists, uh, you know, Serena especially touched on this tremendously, right? the supply chain challenges. Right? And so, so I need to move toward a, a zero trust kind of environment. And, and oftentimes when we think of adding in security, and I know I'm here on my, on my other laptop, which I'm notably not on this, this chat for, uh, my, my, my secure DOD laptop, uh, the security pieces make it very difficult to use and security often kind of makes things brittle, right? So what we wanna do is can we actually turn that around and can we make the security to enhance the resilience and the availability, not limit it, right? With spectrum agility, with all the, the cool features of 5G, we not only wanna do that confidentiality and integrity, but can we improve the resilience and the availability of the system? I think there's huge potential for that. So I think, you know, those are sort of our main challenges. And, uh, you know, 
adding into all that with the cybersecurity piece. Thanks, Vincent. Awesome. So I know we're running low on time. We have to do a poll question so that you can get your CPE for those of you who are, are getting that for this event. So if you want to pull up the poll question, Alyssa, that'd be great. Um, you have it here. Uh, we'd like to know how many of you have included 5G or related IoT applications in your FY22 budgets, right? This is very much uh, targeted towards the government or, or academia industry. But, but as you look at this, uh, please answer yes or no and go ahead and submit. Uh, we'll be very... We'll be very quick about it, right? And um, so, great. We'll, we'll give that a minute. And oh, I'm told we have a little bit extra time. So if we if we go over a bit over 1100 Eastern, um, that works. So perfect. All right. So um, with that, um, let me go ahead. The, so for closing question, right? Um, so based on our, what everybody mentioned, right? We want to have sort of a, this call to action. So. Uh, what are you? What are the the one, two, three, whatever things that you think the U.S. should be doing right now to protect our interests and ensure the U.S. is in a leadership position with regard to 5G? And we aren't, you know, following other nations per se, right? So protecting U.S. interests. Um, go ahead and start, uh, Dr. Roy. Submit. Sure. <clears throat> um, so. Uh... You know, one of the, uh, I already mentioned that, you know, um, uh, one of the key imperatives for uh, uh, us as a, as a nation is to look at uh, leadership positions in these technologies, uh, which of course means that, you know, we invest in, in early research and development, deploy, test, etc. But also we look to work with our allies as well as we look to future standardization. So I think that, you know, the fact that the government, particularly DOD, is investing significantly early. We are sort of becoming an early investor, you know, sort of an angel investor in this business early. And, you know, providing the infrastructure for testing are the necessary right steps, as well as, you know, the, the, the policy front. You know, so that, uh, you know, as a as sort of as a whole of government, the government is grappling with how to engage on in 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 uh, standardization in working with our uh, not not just you know on behalf of our nation but in working with uh, our partners overseas, uh, and I see I see all of these uh, aspects investing in the technology, looking at policy, looking at deployment, testing as all piece, pieces of the whole in order to move this forward. Thank you. Great, Serena. Sure. I think um, one of the key pieces that we've really looked at is just the fact that a lot of the deployment is really going to happen at the critical infrastructure owner and operator level, even outside of the information technology and the communications sector. So that increased cyber education awareness is extremely important, um, certainly between supply chain risks, the virtualization piece, um, the IoT elements, and just the sheer opportunities for threat actors to utilize 5G infrastructure to, uh, to execute attacks is gonna be something that we need to communicate widely and really think about the policy decisions that will be made um, coming down the road and really understanding these risks are really, really critical to establishing a secure and interoperable 5G communication. Um, we also talk a little bit about the policy and standards piece and that engagement that we do um, with our industry partners. And then certainly the innovation um, element that uh, many of the panelists talked about from their R&D um, focus areas and really encouraging innovation in the 5G marketplace to foster um, those trusted 5G vendors and that ICP supply chain piece, I think is gonna be extremely critical. Awesome. Uh, Diago? Yeah, sure. I think uh, implicit in the question is that, you know, is the US uh, lagging behind? I think it's important to remember that, look, you know, we were among the first to identify the use of millimeter waves for 5G spectrum. We are among the leaders. We are actually among the leaders in the deployment of 5G uh, uh, internationally. There are other countries, some that shall not be named, who are actually catching up or who are actually keeping pace with us. So we are not used to us not being the sole leaders, right? Yes, maybe we have somebody who's running head to head with us, but I would think of this as, yes, this is gonna challenge us to stay up to date and you know, be on top of things even more than anything else, right? Now that we have a competition, you know, uh, we are still ahead, but not the, nothing like somebody right behind you to keep you running faster, right? And I, I think that we are doing a pretty good job of it. And uh, the folks that you see in this room and the Zoom are exemplars of how they are putting in place to keep make, make it happen. And I think it's important for us to remember that, especially in what we have seen from what we have seen in the COVID days for the last one year, that communication networks 
are going to be the future. In some sense, you know, remember, remember the in innovations in society that came up as a result of having sanitation, right? Having good toilets, plumbing systems that you know, hundred years ago. We are at a critical juncture where we, you know, instead of using the cell phone as an optional communication mechanism, we have gone to rely on it almost exclusively to do everything that we do in on our daily lives. And that is only going to become more critical. Therefore, we have to continue to focus on making sure that this infrastructure, this communication infrastructure is affordable, is always available, is reliable, and is robust under, under any circumstances, right? And robustness can mean secure, right? It mean, means being always available no matter what disaster strike, right? So we need to keep our, our eyes on that particular ball. Like we are gone past a point of no return. There's no going back to not having a cell phone anymore, right? You're your a smartphone. You are going to rely on these advanced communication technologies. And it's important for us to keep in mind that it's going from focusing on technology to focusing on robustness, reliability, and making it a solid thing that we can always count on uh, to do what we want to do is going to be the thing for the next few years for us. Great, thank you, Tara. Dan? Great, so I'll, um, I can kind of wrap this one up here then. Uh, so. Uh, so I think one of the biggest things we can do going forward, most important thing call to action is not to do this as a siloed approach, right? So I'll point to some real good ex successes. The Federal Mobility Group is, is a great example of that. Activities at NIDRD, D, right? Uh, where there's collaboration um, with, uh, with NIST, uh, led, led by CISA with NIST and DOD, we're looking at a common security assurance process. So how do we actually how do we actually get ATOs for this cool new technology? As we, authorities to operate. Uh, sorry, I have too many acronyms there. But how do we get authority to operate for uh, for this new technology? Uh, how do we collaborate so that we don't have our you know our our basic research and that forward-looking research that NSF is doing disconnected from from what uh, what DoD or or DHS or other groups are doing? And so we need to. We need to collaborate on on solicitations, and and I think we're we're starting to do a good job on that, and so I think we'll hopefully see more of that going forward. But I really think it is that that key piece. This is not a DoD problem, or a DHS problem, or an NSF problem. This is a this is a challenge for all of us, and the more we can collaborate on those those things, I think the better. So it's it's great to have this combination of folks in the panel, and we're going to uh, continue along those lines as uh, working together. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. So just want to thank all the panelists uh, here today from DOD, from CISA, from NSF. I uh, really appreciate the great conversation. I know we had extra time, so that was really awesome, actually. So um, very much. Thank you so much. I know. Um, so just keeping track and trying to keep on time. Um, I'll, I'll put a plug that um, there is a, a, an effort for uh, April 27th, 28th with uh, Dr. Roy and, and, and Federal Mobility Group. So Advanced Wireless Test Platform and Federal Mobility Group hosting more of a, a collaboration testing to support you know that in, in the 5G space uh, going forward. So um, the next, uh, the next uh, panel that we have going up will be led by Mr. Jim Russo is my, my understanding, um, right? And um, so we'll go ahead and switch over to the next, next part of the agenda. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Vincent and panelists. Up next, we're going to have our only emerging technology talk of the day. So if Farron, if you want to go ahead and um, turn your video on and your sound on. Um, Farron, I don't want to butcher your last name, but you are the senior solutions architect over at Avanti. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing from you today. Thank you, Alyssa. Yes, uh, my name is Farhan Safadin. I'm a senior solutions architect here with Avanti. Uh, formerly Mobile Iron. Um, I'm going to go through a, a quick presentation on the mobile centric zero trust approach. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen out. And Alyssa, do I sound okay? Yes, perfect. All right. And can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. You're seeing uh, the Prezo, correct? I have a few screens here. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna walk through the mobile centric zero trust approach. Um, but first a little bit about Ivanti. Um, Ivanti recently acquired Mobile Iron and Pull Secure at the end of last year. And our, our goal is to 
essentially provide the end-to-end -end platform for the everywhere enterprise. And uh, a lot of great discussion this morning. Um, you know, 5G has truly enabled us to work from anywhere. And I think during the pandemic, we realized that the most, right? Um, we're, we're able to work from everywhere. And I, I think government agencies have also quickly adopted that as well. And they've done so successfully, a lot of them. Um, so uh, what we do is we have uh, three product pillars um, to enable that everywhere enterprise. Uh, our endpoint management pillar, uh, we have asset ma management and service management, and then a zero trust and security pillar um, that combined provides a the ability to discover, manage, secure, and service, as well as automate all your endpoints across the enterprise um, from a uh, configuration, management, and security perspective. A little bit about Avanti and uh, Mobile Iron. We are a leader in government and regulatory compliance. Um, our products are FIPS 140-2 certified. We actively participate in the, the federal mobility groups. Um, for instance, with uh, David Harris in the FISMA compliance and uh, the mobility metrics there, um, actively participating in, in uh, many NIST special publications around derived and uh, um, uh, bring your own device as well as corporate owned personally enabled um, uh, uh, mobile endpoints, um, as well as uh, actively involved in the DOD community with uh, creating uh, and um, enabling this uh, STIGs um, and the uh, uh, classified community as well. I did want to highlight a, a couple of our customers um, that have successfully deployed mobile endpoints and adopted 5G technologies. Um, the Defense Information Systems Agency, uh, Defense Mobil Mobility Unclassified Capability, uh, DMUC, is uh, a, a one of our large federal customers. Um, they secure and manage over 130 iOS and Android endpoints. Um, and over the pandemic, they were able to roll out Office 365 to those mobile endpoints as well. Um, they use our unified endpoint management solution, as well as our PIVD manager to derive credentials from their CAC um, smart cards and uh, store them on mobile devices for authentication. Additionally, we have a federal system integrator uh, uh, customer that I'd like to reference, um, Raytheon Technologies. Uh, recently uh, chose Mobile Iron after um, an acquisition between uh, the legacy Raytheon company and a company called United Technologies, very large federal system integrator um, that provides um, military and uh, defense um, services. Um, and they have standardized on the Mobile Iron Unified Endpoint Management solution to manage their mobile endpoints, um, as well as uh, use, uses our access zero sign-on solution uh, to authenticate to cloud-based services, essentially leveraging the mobile device as an identity source um, from any endpoint, whether it be a laptop or a desktop. Um, they can use their mobile device and the native biometrics capabilities to authenticate to uh, Office 365, for instance. So what mobile and cloud has really um, created is, is this architecture, right? Your, your data is now everywhere. Um, there are many different types of endpoints that end users um, want to use and need to use, and many different uh, cloud services um, that uh, may share common identity or, or may not. Um, and the data is uh, now not in a centralized uh, on-premise network. It is literally everywhere. So how do we get insight into that data? Who has access to what? Um, what devices should be allowed to access that data? Um, what apps should be allowed to access that data? Um, that, that is the problem that um, Mobile Iron and, and now Avanti uh, is, is here to solve. Um, we, we call this the everywhere workplace, right? There are more devices out there in, in the eco ecosystem. Uh, there are more platforms um, on various operating systems, uh, which also means more applications. And I think we'll see um, you know, those applications develop over time to adopt to the 5G um, and, and beyond. And what that also means is more networks and more services that ultimately are 
um, end users uh, need access to. And that's where the zero trust model comes in from a security perspective is to assume security threats are already in your enterprise. And the enterprise now, right, is no longer, again, just um, your, your on-prem resources, right? It now extends to cloud and mobile. Um, and what we do is we don't give inherited trust to the device, the user, the app. We ensure that we, one, validate the device is locked down into a known good state. Then we are able to establish user context, whether that means we're deriving a credential from a smart card like a PIV or a CAC, or establishing user context through some sort of identity proofing method so that we can actually use our mobile endpoint as an authentication source. Um, we're seeing a lot more capabilities in the federal agency around that as well. And then we're able to check app authorization. So the actual mobile apps that are being leveraged um, with either backends on on-prem services or cloud services, we ensure that those apps are um, approved and um, authorized to be able to access ultimately your, your enterprise data. Uh, we also verify that the networks that the mobile endpoints connect to are, are valid, whether you want to ensure that a VPN payload um, has been enabled or you're connected to a um, you know, secure Wi-Fi network, um, you know, we can check those different characteristics before we allow that device to connect. And finally, we can detect and remediate threats, right? And I think this is an important piece um, that oftentimes gets overlooked. Um, you know, mobile endpoints, um, you know, are the new um, uh, place where uh, end users are spending more of their time, right? Instead of in front of a laptop or a desktop, they're in front of their mobile device and, and the hackers are following that. So to be able to detect uh, mobile specific um, threats and remediate them on the device is an important um, piece of this puzzle. And all this needs to be done on an ongoing compliance enforcement basis, right? So you need a policy engine that can look at these different characteristics and make real time decisions on if a device user app should be allowed to ultimately access your enterprise data. Uh, and, and what we've put together is a mobile centric zero trust architecture around that problem set. So starting from the bottom is our unified endpoint management solution, uh, which all of the other pieces kind of uh, essentially are extended from. Um, the, the UEM, um, formerly EMM, formerly mobile device management, MDM, um, is the policy engine, right? Um, the, the big difference now is that we can support many different types of operating systems um, and also has an integrated app store. Uh, this is where you would provision a secure workspace, um, remotely wipe the device if it's lost, stolen, uh, jailbroken or compromised. Um, and all of the, uh, there, there's automation built into this as well. So it's not that an administrator has to be actively um, in the UEM solution. You would set automated policies to detect those types of events and, and take certain actions. Uh, a, uh, for your legacy on-prem resources, um, an intelligent gateway called Mobile Iron Sentry also exists. Um, this provides conditional access to all of your on-prem resources, whether it's Exchange, uh, ActiveSync, um, you know, or leverage as a per app VPN on mobile and uh, I, uh, Mac OS and Windows 10 as well. Um, we can do a per app VPN capability instead of opening the entire device to the enterprise IT, you can whitelist specific apps um, where the VPN would um, initiate when that app is launched seamlessly. And then Mobile Iron Access provides an, a similar conditional access um, technology except for cloud services that are integrated with identity providers. Um, the additional benefit of access is we provide a zero sign-on capability where you can actually leverage the native biometrics built into the mobile endpoint. So if it's an Apple device, you might be leveraging Face ID on Android, similar technologies, um, or Touch ID, uh, and you can ultimately leverage your biometrics to actually authenticate to those cloud and on-prem resources that are integrated with identity providers. And then finally, threat defense. If there are any um, device, network, application, or phishing attacks on that modern endpoint, uh, it's important to detect those, but also to remediate them. So we can do things like remove mobile applications, remove access to any of those backend IT resources or the cloud services if that device becomes compromised. Compromised. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
this is a high level architecture that we actually put together um, for the, the CDM program. Um, essentially putting all the pieces together, right? The unified endpoint management, um, the cloud access and the threat defense. Um, all of that information uh, categorizes uh, security threats and device security posture. And all of that information can be forwarded onto a centralized dashboard, um, whether you're using Splunk or similar technologies. Um, and ultimately, you know, for your knock and sock reporting. Um, so we can take that information, um, aggregate it, and send it to a centralized dashboard for reporting, monitoring, and, and compliance. Mobile Iron Access, um, again, this is our uh, cloud uh, zero sign on solution. Essentially, what this does is enables us to uh, provide a multi factor authentication using native biometrics on the mobile device to authenticate to those cloud services. Um, we ad additionally use characteristics on the device um, to ultimately provide that access to the cloud service. So if the device is compromised, has it been jailbroken? Um, is the user using the right app, the right sanctioned app? Uh, is the user um, proving they are who they say, say they are using a biometric capability? Um, is the operating system at the right um, uh, OS version? Has it been patched? We're checking all those characteristics and then making a risk-based decision on if we should allow that device to connect right then and there. If not, um, you know, we, we don't allow that, that trust and uh, don't allow that access. Um, I have a very quick demo on how that works. I'm actually going to just do it live. So on my uh, mobile iron managed device here, um, I'm going to get a notification um, after I go to my home.mobileiron.com page. Um, I get a push notification on my mobile iron device. I simply click it, leverage face ID to um, authenticate the session. And my access is granted on my mobile device. And then automatically on my laptop here, I am now logged in to all of the cloud services I need to do my work. Um, this is how we enable the everywhere enterprise, right? You can essentially pick up any device and now access your, your work information. Um, additional data loss prevention control can be enabled. Um, and then we're also leveraging mobile iron threat defense to ensure that the authentication source itself, which I think you're not able to see in this screen, but um, that no threats are on the device itself that is being used for the authentication. The next thing I want to talk about is um, just how much mobile has evolved, right? We're now seeing five times more uh, traditional, um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, five times more mobile devices than traditional endpoints being shipped to customers um, in the enterprise. 60% um, of enterprise endpoints are now mobile um, and end users are spending more time on their mobile devices than traditional laptops and desktops, um, you know, three times amount. Uh, but however, the dollars invested in mobile endpoint security has not followed that trend. Um, we're only seeing about uh, half a percentage on uh, um, dollars invested on endpoint security related um, products, specifically with threat defense. Um, what threat defense does is it provides uh, real time on device protection against known and unknown threats, right? So what we do with mobile iron threat defense uh, is we have uh, partnered with uh, Zimperium to detect and remediate those device network application and phishing level attacks by embedding the Zimperium uh, mach machine learning engine into our mobile iron MDM agent that runs on the mobile device, right? Um, so that allows us to uh, have one app to deploy um, uh, and, and get the benefits of the threat detection and the benefits of the remediation enabled in the um, mobile device management solution. Uh, this is supported on both iOS and Android um, and allows us to um, uh, essentially detect those advanced compromise um, types of threats, um, including phishing. And phishing is um, uh, probably the number one um, vulnerability that we're seeing in, in most enterprises. It's how hackers get in 
um, they are uh, maliciously sending links or having end users do things um, you know, that, that may seem um, legitimate, but they're not. Um, and I have a very quick demo on what that looks like from a mobile endpoint perspective. So this is the uh, mobile iron agent. Um, in, uh, in the mobile iron agent, we actually give insight to the end user if there are any threats active on that device um, to get the end user involved in the cybersecurity process. Um, that can be enabled or disabled depending on um, if you want to expose that information, but we, we find it helpful um, to include the end user in that process. Uh, on the right here is a, um, an iOS device um, where we're going to send an SMS link um, through iMessage and the mobile iron threat defense will detect that it's a malicious link and uh, not allow the end user to proceed to the website. So here the end user gets uh, a uh, iMessage message. They simply click that link and then right then and there would just simply block them. Um, a lot of things happen in the back end. Um, we can uh, alert the administrator that um, a threat has been um, uh, uh, detected on a particular device and categorize that um, for reporting. Um, and then also feed uh, the um, backend solution with um, any of the information from the device, where the device was, the IP address of the device, um, which, you, which user was um, using the device um, or the, the user was tied to the device. Um, all that information is logged um, and uh, can be exported via reporting capabilities. Additionally, we also uh, can publish mobile applications. So we're starting to see a lot more agencies develop mobile apps. Um, and and uh, you run into this problem of how do you uh, publish that app, not only to the public Apple App Store and Google Play stores, but to the various enterprise mobility management solutions that might be um, in that agency um, or the several agencies that that app um, may be deployed to. Um, what we've done is uh, acquired a company called Encaptic Connect um, that um, essentially will validate the app itself, um, provide all the metadata around the app. So when you upload that app to the uh, Apple App Store and the Google Play Store, there are um, T's and C's uh, that need to be uh, validated. There are, um, there's a signing process where you need to actually um, sign, digitally sign the mobile application before it can be released on those app stores. Um, and, and similar processes with the enterprise mobility management solutions as well. So we've basically taken that manual process of having to sign the app, um, having to get the various approvals from the stakeholders of the app, um, right? The application developer, the application owner, the QA folks, and then the security folks as well um, to ensure that they um, have a formal process of approving that app before it gets published. We basically take that time from doing that manually or um, from uh, uh, separate systems into a single system um, that can uh, manage that app from uh, development to publishing um, in a much quicker um, and formal process. I think uh, someone might be off mute. Um, okay, the final thing I want to talk about is derived credentials. Um, Mobile Iron has been an innovator in derived credentials since inception, um, since the release of uh, the NIST uh, special publications uh, 800-157. Uh, we've also uh, actively engaged in the uh, NIST uh, special publications 1800-12C. We have a reference architecture there with our derived credential solution. Um, for those that don't know who, what a derived credential is, essentially it is a uh, solution that can derive a certificate um, from your CAC or uh, PIV card um, and store that information on a mobile device so you can authenticate, you can encrypt, and you can sign um, in mobile applications. Um, we integrate with the DoD uh, Purebred program, uh, Entrust, Xtech, and Interseed as um, uh, PKI providers. Um, and the use cases are around um, digitally signing email, encrypting email, um, encrypting and decrypting um, uh, other applications using um, an identity certificate um, or an encryption certificate, um, digitally signing PDFs um, through mobile apps with a uh, signing certificate derived from your uh, CAC or PIV, 
And then also authenticating to any uh, web uh, website that is already CAC and PIV enabled, right, um, from your mobile device. So you don't have to physically plug in a, a smart card. Um, you would use a derived credential on your mobile endpoint to authenticate to all those resources instead. So that's uh, all I had. Um, if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat or uh, feel free to contact me um, at this email address below. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Farron. That was a great presentation. Up next, we're going to have our second panel of the day if Jim Russo wants to come on and introduce his panel. Hey, thanks, Alyssa. Uh, yes, I'm back and um, here with the industry's perspective panel. Um, you know, you heard the very uh, illuminating panel with Vincent and uh, a number of folks from DOD and CISA earlier. And uh, now we want to give some time for uh, our star panel here to talk about um, what industry's perspective is on 5G and its benefits to the government. So uh, without further delay, let me get right into introducing our, our team here. We have Maggie Halbach, who is a senior executive with Verizon enterprise solutions, and she leads a nationwide team responsible for customer engagement and solutions development. Uh, we have Mar Mark McDermott. He's the senior vice president of radio network engineering and development at T-Mobile USA. We also have Max Silber. He's Mattel's vice president of mobility and internet of things. Uh, and also we have Bob Zabataki, he is the senior principal architect with AT&T Public Sector. So thank you all for joining and uh, welcome. Um, we uh, are um, have a limited time and a lot to get to, so let's get right into the questions. Uh, so consumer marketing has been focusing on faster speeds and cool devices, almost to the exclusion of other benefits of 5G can bring to the table. So um from your perspective you know what are the true benefits for the government when it comes to 5g services and bob let's start with you on that you know what have you been talking to um, in terms of use cases with with uh, agencies hey thanks jim uh and again thanks for the opportunity um we're seeing as it, as it comes down there's a, there's a lot of use cases that we're looking at a couple that really come to mind are the use of ar vr technologies for training and, and what's sometimes referred to as instant expert scenarios. Uh, video has been used for quite some time, but the evolution of, of 5G uh, has provided the opportunity for moving edge computing and the capability, the lower latency and speeds uh, to, the, to the extent that video can now be leveraged as a real-time or near real-time sensor. Uh, and we're also seeing, um, you know, looking a lot at robotics, especially when it comes to uh, high human risk scenarios uh, like disaster recon and uh, foreign object detection. I think AR VR is probably one of the the biggest up and coming areas. Uh, when you when you look at AR VR from a training perspective, um, studies are showing that retention rates for uh, augmented reality and virtual reality immersive training can be as high as 75% versus, uh, versus the 5 to 10% for traditional lecture style or reading based type trainings. Um, a, a significant majority of uh, trainees actually enjoy and prefer AR VR type training. Um, even though they have to wear funny headgear a lot of times, they still like it. Um, but uh, other studies have also shown that the, um, that kind of training leads to fewer uh, issues from a task completion perspective. So um, errors that might occur from traditional training rates that, uh, that you'd see are much lower, sometimes 50% lower than the traditional training. And then the instant expert scenario where you've got folks in the field that have the ability to call in uh, additional support, kind of the over-the-shoulder type methodology, uh, where they might be using, again, a, a heads-up display type application or even a tablet application, and have um, the augmentation as well as additional support and coaching while they're doing that whatever that particular task is to support uh, 
support that. So we're seeing a tremendous amount in that area. So yeah, that's a new twist on uh, phoning a friend. Uh, if you can do that with yeah, AOR exactly. assistance. Actually, I wish I had some of that assistance for this panel so I could remember everything you guys are saying, but I'm sure we can play it back later. Uh, so Maggie, um, what, uh, what have you been talking about with agencies? Yeah, so uh, a lot in the um, industrial IoT space. Um, and so just to piggyback on uh, Bob's comments, uh, we've been doing a lot of work with the DOD uh, with regard to how industrial sensors um, and large uh, data uh, movement uh, can occur. Um, so you think about things like inbound aircraft um, I think we have all seen in our own uh, personal consumer world of the planes coming inbound, getting connected with a big giant cable. Um, and then, you know, all of the equipment running around the tarmac. Um, but imagine when you're running uh, a mission um, and you're trying to turn aircraft in a much more rapid pace, uh, the types of industrialized sensors uh, that help to extract data off of aircraft, signal to maintenance crews, um, be able to then have that logistics to transport that information back to the aircraft and the maintenance technicians. Um, we also are seeing a tremendous amount in the area of deployment of uh, autonomous um, and I'm not really talking about self-driving cars, but more the types of autonomous uh, vehicles within large uh, uh, warehousing facilities, um, but also robotics. Um, and so being able to actually have uh, the types of machine learning to trigger uh, the movement of uh, parts and supplies um, has been uh, something that is gaining a lot of traction in the prototypes that we are developing. Um, and then the second place I think that is seeing a tremendous amount of investment is in healthcare. Um, and we're not really talking about uh, robotic surgery. I don't think any of us is prepared to have that happen quite yet. Um, but what we're really talking about is in the area of imaging, right? So to Bob's point, um, you know, we've all had that experience of sitting in uh, the waiting room, waiting for some radiologist or uh, some technician to evaluate an MRI or even just a basic x-ray. Um, imagine that being uh, able to be analyzed in real time and actually imagine um, that there is uh, AI that is augmenting the evaluation of that image, not to imply that uh, humans are error prone, but sometimes humans miss things uh, that machines uh, can catch. And so we are working with uh, the VA uh, in Palo Alto on these types of use cases that allow for more real time imaging um, so that uh, we can speed care, uh, we can improve the quality of care. Um, and uh, it really, as Bob mentioned, is to augment uh, human beings, uh, to support human beings in their ability to actually see things uh, more quickly, to diagnose, diagnose them more consistently, um, and then also uh, for patients that might be suffering from a, uh, a disease or a, a catastrophic event like a stroke, uh, where time can be of the essence, uh, being able to shorten uh, the time frame of diagnosis to care. So we have a lot of really, um, I think, very impactful uh, areas where 5G, particularly in the ultra wideband space, with the capability of multi access edge compute. Um, is really uh, driving some significant changes in the way we think about the work in government. Okay, thanks, Maggie. You touched on a lot of things there, IoT, uh, edge compute. Uh, Max, um, you know, what, uh, you know, how, how do you want to follow that up? Uh, I know you're doing some work. Sure. Around. Yeah, so I, and I think that the, there's a common theme here. We're seeing this blending of what used to be two separate things, 5G and IoT. Uh, now it's it's really all 
uh, blending into one to help uh, agencies complete tasks in a safer manner and a more automated manner. And I think that's really where the technology is driving. Uh, we're seeing a lot of, and I, and I heard Bob give some great examples that we're seeing in field services today, the use of uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, almost for apprenticeships, uh, almost for being able to send field inspectors out to complete inspections on infrastructure, complete inspections on livestock, if they're in the Department of Agriculture, um, and be able to get that information back, obviously, with faster speeds, uh, and then the second part, which, which I think uh, Maggie just touched on, is it's not just about pulling these large feeds of video back into some hub and then reviewing it, but injecting some AI, injecting some intelligence. And, and I don't know that we're there quite yet, but getting that edge computing maybe in the next release of 5G to where uh, it can become smarter. We started doing that today on fleet solutions, for example where we've got in-vehicle cameras looking at the driver. And we can see when the driver starts to close their eyes and put their head down and we know they're falling asleep. So the AI engine triggers an alarm to wake them up. Or we know if one of their arms isn't on the steering wheel and uh, their eyes are looking to the same direction as the hand uh, down, that they're looking at their text messages. So we can make them aware of, hey, you, you really shouldn't be texting and, and driving. So I think those are some of the, only the preliminary areas where we're utilizing AI and we're utilizing those live video feeds to be able to take action as we start to really deploy the next generation of edge computing and make all those decisions live at the edge, not have to backhaul them uh, in, to, to some kind of processing engine. That experience is just going to get better and the overall output is uh, you're going to have a better, more automated process and ultimately a safer process for everyone. Okay, thanks, Mac. Max. Uh, Mark, you want to add to that? Or we have a question that just came in from the audience that you might want to pick up on, um, which is the uh, increasing interest and in use cases in AR and VR with those. Do you expect a shift to 6G? Okay, we're still on 5G, but we're expecting a, six, a shift to 6G to happen without an extensive amount of time in R&D to move forward. So- <clears throat> Yeah, maybe I'll a couple of comments, Jim, on that one. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, just briefly to wrap up, and my, panel, my fellow panelists did a great job covering the use cases that uh, the government can enjoy with 5G. I would just add one, one which is really the elephant in the room, the big one. Uh, the goal is to bring choice uh, to, to buying, bring prices down, create competition for uh, services and really deliver simplified price and economically attractive services. And doing that with 5G at T-Mobile is, is part of the mission of that question. Um, there's, there's no question that the, uh, uh, the capabilities of 5G as we, we've implemented it to date are still very much emerging. So while I think uh, any work that's done on the and the generation that follows uh, may, may proceed in the, the research and development domain. I think it's maybe premature to think of uh, uh, introducing ideas or concepts in 6G uh, in, the, in that framework, because it's very much a conceptual place to be right now. Plus <clears throat> the use cases that uh, we encounter day to day uh, can be adequately dealt with within the 5G domain. So lots of opportunity right here today. Okay, thanks. A uh, good time to pause here and uh, introduce our poll question for this se segment. Um, so if um, Alyssa, if you could pop that up. Um, okay, so um, read this or answer this in the context of what you're doing today. So, you know, a lot of, personally, I would answer this, would have answered this differently a year and a half ago than I would answer today. But how many of you are using your own devices today for work purposes. So we'll give you a, a minute or two to uh, weigh in on that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's ongoing um, improvements, as you said, Mark, in 5G, you know, we just really just been scratching the surface, um, you know, in addition to, you know, what we're seeing with just the simplistic, I won't call it simple, but the meat and potatoes, the block and tackling, the, the infrastructure, you know, getting the uh, signals rolled out and the spectrum 
um, integrated so that we have a seamless 5G infrastructure to do all this on. Um, you know, we've, you know, we are leveraging, as they said in the earlier panel, the existing 4G um, infrastructure. So um, expecting that, you know, we'll see kind of a, of that incremental change in capabilities as we go forward on, on all counts. Um, but I think, Jim, we are seeing an acceleration in the rate of adoption, right? So there, there was certain time that it took to adopt 3G. There was certain time that it took to. Yep. I think Maggie froze there. Um, I think she was making a great point. Um, Let's see. Yeah, she has a very, very good point. If you, if you really look at adoption um, from an industry perspective, and I know a lot of us had a lot of years in, in this industry, but this is probably the, the shortest period of time I've seen from technical specification development to network implementation for technology as it rolls along. We are sitting here looking at release 16 from 3GPP and the implementation timeframe for the technical specifications from that release is compressed dramatically. And the fact that COVID has delayed release 17 is actually a problem for the industry because of the speed at which these implementations have been going on. So it's, it's very, very interesting. Okay, let's do a quick view of, and hopefully we're getting Maggie back online, uh, get a quick view of the results. And I'm actually surprised here I, with the last answer. I never use my own device for work, which is uh, 27%. But um, okay, um, pretty much spread across the board here um, with the lead of using it regularly almost every day um, at 38%. Okay, um, let's move on from that. Um, so Mark, I guess I'll pitch this to you. Uh, there's an expectation that 5G will be more secure than previous wireless generations, higher level security for the network, user access and uh, data protection. Um, can you speak to how those expectations are going to be met? Certainly, yeah. Thanks, Jim. I think um, first thing to acknowledge really is uh, uh, the, the concept of security and specifications and standards under 3GPP. Uh, we've certainly seen investment in those standards when it comes to security and uh, the design of security architectures. But part of the elephant in the room, if you will, is that uh, those are international standards and quite heavily influenced by uh, foreign nations that uh, may not have our interests at heart. So certainly at T-Mobile, we're very focused on making sure that security and provisions for security are designed into the radio network, the core, the devices, the SIM cards, and obviously any applications that we build right from day one. So security as a design principle is absolutely imperative. And I would just caution everybody on the, uh, on, the, on the call today to think through the reality of standards today. It's really much more like a large box of Lego, uh, which you get to assemble yourself. But if you don't pay attention to how you assemble it, you won't get what you want. And it's certainly true when it comes to security. So I'll pause there and hand it back to you, Jim. But there's a couple of perspectives from, from me on that. Hey, thanks. Uh, Mac, do you have any um, thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I, I was just, I was just still letting the, uh, the poll question sink in that 38% of people using their own device. And I think deployment methodology is really important here. Yes, 5G, whether it's designed as a private uh, element or private network for an agency or public use, with the right layers of security, it's still going to be 10 times better than 38% of the participants using their own phone, probably without any layered security. So I think the, the part, of, part of security is that deployment methodology. And the example I'll give is if I was to try to hack into a network, not that I would ever do that, I would probably try to do that with someone on their home Wi-Fi using their personal device as the point of entry. I wouldn't try to kind of knock on, you know, knock on the front gate um, so, so that's that's an important element here. Is how do you create that deployment methodology? How do you systematically deploy devices that then can access um, internal systems and federal networks, as opposed to just looking at you know how much better is the 5G network security than uh, LTE network security, for example, which it is 
I, you know, from everything I've seen, the 5G network is better. It is more secure. So there's definitely benefits for agencies, but there's also an importance to look at that behind the scenes of how devices are being deployed today. Okay. Um, yeah, I, Bob, you say a few about that. I saw you went to- Sure. Yeah, I, I, I mean, very, very important points. Yes, right. There are a number of improvements in, in the 5G world, but uh, as pointed out, uh, you know, by uh, Max and, and by Mark, it's not, uh, you know, you don't rely on the network itself. So, I mean, if you look at um, AT&T published, uh, our ninth edition of the AT&T Cybersecurity Insights was primarily geared towards 5G, and three quarters of the respondents uh, had very, uh, very high levels, medium high to high levels of concern about the effects 5G is going to have on their on their current standards uh, security posture. And and of those areas, right, of the questions that were asked, the three top areas that, that they had concerned about were really about the number of devices and the types of devices. So it really had a lot to do with increased attack surface associated with uh, the expected explosion of devices connecting, um, the variety of both traditional and non-traditional devices that would be connected, and the complexity of extending security policy to these devices. So when you think about what, what that means and you look at what 5G is and, and from a software def defined networking perspective, how it's built, one of the things that's important, as was pointed out, is that you really need uh, a model that is kind of a shared model, right? You've got a, a provider and you've got a, an, an agency or an organization, and those two groups have to kind of come together to develop um, a security policy that works, especially in areas among virtualization, automation, software-defined networking, like we said, um, and identity and, and, and authentication. Those are critical, and that shared concept needs to be looked at and established from a security policy perspective going forward. If it hasn't already, if, if organizations haven't already started to adopt that, what you don't want is uh, islands of of you know of your network or your um, organizational locations that are that are not secure because those islands will effectively spread whatever um, whatever uh, uh, has gone through to within the entire organization. Okay, thanks, Bob. I see Maggie is back. Um, so uh, thanks, so thankfully the technology worked there. Um, Sorry about that. So follow up for you. Well, uh, sometimes stuff happens. So follow up for you on this question though. Um, we're talking about security implications. And you gave us a, a great example earlier about um, you know, an, uh, an example where there were a lot of sensors involved. So um, how should agencies prepare for security implications that may, be, you know, may arise from um, you know, a lot of sensors, proliferation of IoT devices? Yeah, I mean, I think I overheard the mobile iron conversation earlier and um, I see Alan Hill, so this will be near and dear to his heart. <laughs> Um, so this all comes down to a zero trust architecture. Um, Verizon has invested in some capabilities around creating a software defined perimeter. Um, and uh, I, I saw the comment in, in one of the chat about kind of the dirty network. Um, and I think what we're seeing is the importance of uh, a hybrid environment where you've got commercial in partnership with private and then adopting this kind of zero trust uh, type of posture. Um, it's really important because what you need to be able to do is connect uh, these environments. And um, as all of us on this panel will attest, we, we require each other's capabilities in order to provide the kind of ubiquitous coverage that we're gonna going to need in both a CONUS as well as an OCONUS kind of structure, right? So when you think about the DOD or healthcare, um, when you think about the missions that all of the um, U.S. government serve uh, worldwide, you've got to have the ability to actually connect all of these uh, components together. 
um, and you need to know that you have confidence. And so some of these regimes that the GSA is working on, that the DOD is working on with CMMC and TIC 3.0 is really critical to the way that data is going to move across these environments. And then the networks are going to integrate and, and interoperate with each other. Um, and so I would definitely um, embrace this idea of uh, we need to ensure that uh, no one is trusted, no thing is trusted until it can properly authenticate. The second area of that is also in 5G, when we start talking about slicing of the network, you actually are going to start serving up networks in a way where you're giving very specific slices of the network to a specific application. And you're gonna know exactly how that sensor and that application is gonna perform on the network. And if it starts to behave in an anomalous kind of way, then you're going to be able to know just through the kinds of AI engines that are already built, that that is not performing within spec. And whether it's actually a malfunction or whether it's a potential threat, you have the ability to lock that down, shut that sensor off, so that it does not either harm the network or actually introduce risk within the operating environment that that sensor is performing. So um, lots of different threads to pull on with many different areas that the GSA is actively engaged in helping to define uh, guidelines and partner with industry like us to, to build a better, safer, and more secure environment for the agencies and the end users. Yes, there's a, there's a, as you said, a lot of threads to pull on there. And I'd love to dive deeper into this whole um, focus area of uh, network slicing, private networks, but um, we are closing in on the end of the session here. Um, so I wanna give you all um, a little bit of time to give us your final thoughts. Um, and um, uh, you don't have to do the words of one syllable or less as we discussed in the prep session because we have a little more time than that. But what's the most important thing that agencies should do today to prepare for 5G uh, implementation rollout? So I'll start with you on that. I'll start with uh, Mark with you on that one. Yeah, very briefly. Thanks, Jen. <clears throat> very briefly, I think it's crucially important to think of the application and the desired performance. Um, you know, in terms of both broadband consumption of data, uh, the need for stability and speed, and, and possibly in some cases, lower latency. So whereas previously, maybe some of these apps, the, the assessment of performance maybe was a secondary consideration, I think, putting it up front and asking the tough question, some of the use cases, uh, Maggie and Bob and Max have, have highlighted, really need a thorough examination of uh, performance needs, and then match it up to the services that are being offered from your provider. Uh, and, and start there. Okay, thanks. Uh, Bob? So, uh, tac very tactic, uh, tactfully, ta <laughs> tactically. Um, I think the, the most important thing that any organization can do is, is uh, establish a focused cross-functional 5G working group. This is going to affect pretty much every aspect of organizations from uh, agency to the departments in the agency. Um, that working group should have the objective to evaluate and develop 5G impact and implementation plans for the organization that they represent. Um, leadership's going to have to be involved in this, but um, if you really want to make sure that you're thoroughly in, engaged across your organization, this is the right thing to do. Okay, uh, Max. Yeah, I would, I would uh, certainly, as, as my colleagues, I think, uh, alluded to as well, you, you really have to start with what's the biggest problem statement or what's the most resource-heavy component of what you do day in and day out uh, on a task. And, and that could be by establishing a working group to start to look at what all those tasks are. Uh, because when you inject uh, technology and automation and high speeds into those specific uh, items of your day-to-day, -day, that's usually when you get the most improvement or the best value back uh, back into the agency. Uh, don't get too swayed by uh, the shiny, pretty devices that uh, manufacturers keep putting out. Just keep it back to what's what's the core task you're trying 
to solve for. Okay, and uh, we'll end with you, Maggie. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody said it well. Start with the problem statement. Um, you know, 5G is super cool, but it's just a tool. Um, and we have plenty of problem statements that we're discussing with agencies right now that don't require 5G. Um, so I, I fully agree. The other thing I would just uh, put a plug in for is um, modernization. Um, so think about how to use, um, you know, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Um, and so uh, the TMF is out there. And so think about how you would be leveraging the types of funding that's available to rethink your business processes, to become more efficient, to become more citizen centric, to deliver services more agilely. Um, and, uh, and like, like the others have said, um, once you focus on those outcomes, uh, then the, the 5G as a tool in your toolbox uh, will just make those solutions more uh, effective. Okay, well, I wanna thank you all in the panel for doing just a great job in the, uh, a little bit of time we've got here. Um, uh, send a message to Tom, I, I think he's, um, I've, heard, I've heard he's stuck in traffic, but if he tunes in later, um, we need to pick up and do another version of this session where we can expand and, and talk about this in a little more depth. So again, thank you all. And um, we're uh, very happy to have had you here and I uh, hope you can join us again soon. Okay, um, with that, let's move on to the uh, wrap up keynote here with uh, my boss, Alan Hill. Um, Alan is um, a pretty staunch supporter of the FMG, and he fully supports what we're doing in 5G, and especially, um, as Maggie mentioned there, uh, a fan of zero trust architectures. Um, so Alan is the Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Category Management in the Office of IT Category within GSA, Federal Acquisition Service. Um, as you know, Federal Acquisition Service provides a lot of things buying platforms and acquisition services for federal DOD, state and local, and other um, users. Uh, so um, broad range of items, including, of course, telecommunications and network services, and all the things we've talked about today, actually. So with that, I'm going to pitch the ball to you, Alan, and um, give you the floor. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. That was a great panel session. Uh, thank you all for spending time today with us this morning and attending this event. Um, it's safe to say that the pandemic has taught those of us working in government IT uh, many lessons. Uh, one is the indisputable value of a well-equipped mobile workforce. Uh, I myself am mobile right now. Um, Wide-scale telework enables uh, the normal operation of government and the steady delivery of services to the American people. Uh, it also keeps much of our federal workforce socially distanced, which is extremely important in this day and age. Uh, mobile technology is rapidly evolving and in demand. Uh, through events like this one today, we can collaborate, share best practices, and learn from each other. Uh, working together across government and with industry will help us stay on track as 5G revolutionizes how IT services are delivered. Uh, the Federal Mar uh, Mobility Group uh, uniquely works across government, bringing together SMEs responsible for mobility. They do the heavy lifting so those of us managing IT can make informed decisions, leveraging best practices. I get regular updates from the Federal, federal Mobility Group uh, in, the, in the work they're doing, which is extremely valued to what I do in helping in my team delivering contract services. Uh, I'd like to thank the SM, FMG leadership and the team at ATARC for inviting us all here today. Uh, I'd like to also commend our speakers for, from both industry and government and thank them for their time and sharing their wisdom on this panel today. I'd like to thank our FMG speakers, uh, Gemma, Vincent, Jim, and Joss for their leadership in keeping the group vibrant and growing. I'd also like to thank our friends at ATARC, Tom and Alicia, for partnering with us for the second annual 5G Government Symposium. 
Uh, thank you again all for attending today. And with that, I have it where I'm going to turn with Tom, but I assume Tom is not here. So uh, who is it, Alicia or, or Kirsten? <laughs> Kirsten, all right, I'm going to turn over to you. Hopefully everybody stays around for the breakout sessions and thank you for attending. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, everyone. So before we go, um, I just want to cover what is next, what you can expect. But first, actually, please take the time to answer this poll question that Alyssa is going to pop up on our screen here. And the question is going to state, was the information shared in today's session help or helpful to you, yes or no? So please go ahead and take a moment and answer that for those of you at home. So thank you guys for answering that. I am particularly excited to talk about what is up next. We will now be offering three collaborative breakout sessions today led by MITRE. ATARC and MITRE have partnered together for many years and some of you may remember how before COVID our in-person summits always incorporated afternoon MITRE sessions. So it is with great pleasure that we are doing that today. All of you should have the instructions and access links to these breakout sessions in your event confirmation emails, but we will post them up in the chat box now so that you can easily copy and paste the right access link and enter the session of your choice. And we've got three sessions today, which include 5G test beds, 5G security, and 5G R&D. So each session will be led by two federal 5G experts and a MITRE moderator. We invite you to... Uh, be interactive, chime in, ask questions, participate actively. And last but not least, we want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you will enjoy these MITRE sessions, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you, guys.